and it will start soon. So I know they're just figuring out what's going on and once we'll, we'll get it going here. So mm -hmm. it looks like we are on YouTube live. So Becca and Peyton, you guys should be able to see the participants as they start coming in. Oh, uh, yeah, I see the attendees there. Okay. Okay, looks like there's a lot more hopping on now. Mm -hmm. Looks like we had 11 attendees. Okay, well, let's give it a couple more uh, minutes for it to start. Just want to say hello to everybody. Uh, we had a couple of technical di difficulties to begin with here, so I apologize for that. You know, we're just trying to work out the kinks. I see uh, Dr. Dury is on right now, too. So uh, let's give it a couple more minutes for people to hop on. Yeah. Well, our, our chat our chat box is open, so I'll be keeping an eye on that. And Peyton, if, if you're going to be on, or Becca, yeah. if you guys want to help keep an eye on the chat box, you know, just in case I miss it, uh, you guys some extra eyes so we can answer some questions as people have questions. Yeah. Yeah. They're probably into, yeah, but she'd probably want to follow up with ENT, you know, if it, even if it stopped. So you could put a pack in and leave a pack in there. Dury, I think you're, uh, oh. you're going to mute yourself. There you go. There we go. Okay, so we are at about uh, 13 attendees with our five panelists. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll hop right into it. So I'll begin with our uh, our welcome. So bind again, buju mino gijeb, manishna beg. So I just said welcome, hello, good morning, native people. Nien nijin dijin akaz, jas kubanesi nigabi wi. My English name is David Morrison Jr. I said uh, I have two Indian names. Uh, Josh Kubanesi is a bluebird. Nigabi Wee is one who was head of everything. Uh, Nidu Dame, Name. My, my clan is a uh, Sturgeon clan. Nien Asabikane Zagi Igun. I'm from Net Lake. So I want to welcome everybody to our Healthy Heart Conference. Our topic for today is about heart health. We plan this conference for February since February is American Heart Month. Our first presenter is Peyton Collins, who is currently the culture coordinator here at Boys Fort. Uh, Peyton's done some of the, so many events she's done for our community for the traditional healing program. Uh, some of the stuff she done was Ojibwe language, drum teachings, winter storytelling, traditional medicines, the process of asking for your Indian, Indian name, four direction tobacco ties, uh, you know, she utilized local band members. She's also utilized community members and people that are willing to share and teach their knowledge for those who want to learn about our, learn about our culture. You know, I applaud her for her passion and energy she brings to the people of Boys Fort. And Peyton, I just want to know that you are an asset and I really appreciate everything that you've been doing. And, you know, it means a lot. Granted, you know, sometimes we don't get the participation that we would like. But, you know, if we could reach uh, one person, I consider that a victory. So, you know, um, again, thank you, Peyton, for everything that you've been doing for our community. And just a short amount of time here, you, you showed to be a, a asset for our community. So without further ado, I will uh, welcome Peyton Collins. She will be talking about stress effects on the heart. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Peyton. But switch. Um, should I be done by like 9.30 then? Or? Uh, you could just, yeah, we'll just wing it to go as, as needed and uh, just do your presentation. Whenever you get done, we'll just leave uh, Q and A's for the end of each presentation. Okay, sounds good. All right, I will share my so, Buju, Indian Oi Maganag, Mengashki Kaya, Indishna Kaz, Peyton Indigo, Rikanako, or Juring and Bujiba, a subgene, Gazagan, and Dow, Minoa, and Okian, Yoko, 
भगवान जो ने मेरा भी जी कर मैं कुछ नहीं तो मैं आया हूँ तो कावी और दाई स्पेन में की जो है um hello my relatives my name is Zoinkash Kikwe or Sweetgrass woman my english name is Peyton Counts i'm originally from Turtle Mountain but i now work and live on the Boys Park reservation as Squidge mentioned i'm the cultural healing coordinator here for the res and so i started in this position in about september and so towards the end of september early october and when i came into this position what i really wanted to do was find a way to make um just cultural knowledge and ceremonies more accessible for community members and trying to have people just have more opportunities to learn stuff that they might not otherwise have access to and stuff like that and so as Squidge mentioned you know I've been doing some a lot of events via Zoom I've got one coming up in March where we're going to be making tobacco pouches and so I'll be sending out information on that to the lister to the work lister and if you guys are interested i will have a registration for that just because we're like having everyone we're going to provide like the leather and all the materials for people to do it so if you guys are interested in that please feel free to look out for that email um and if you guys have any suggestions of people to talk to or things you guys want to see i'm always open to hear what community members want like i feel like that's kind of the point of the job is to be able to talk to the community and see what the community wants and needs and try to bring that and make that happen. So, um, but today we're gonna talk a little bit about mental health and heart health and kind of the connections of that and maybe some ways that you guys can take care of yourselves. Um, I like to start off with this quote. It's from a Canadian First Nations elder. It says, silence is dangerous when we pretend the problem is not there. Communication is a healer to break the silence. And so to me, that quote really can encompass a lot of different things. But when we think about our mental health, our heart health, um, sometimes people don't really like to talk about those things or really kind of struggle to maybe ask for help when they need it. And so to be able to really open up that communication with somebody else and really reach out for help is the biggest thing that you can do to break the silence and be able to help yourself. So. When we think about heart health, you know, our heart, it pumps the blood to our bodies, it's taking care of us. Um, but there's actually a lot of connections between heart health and mental health. And so nowadays, like you hear a lot of people having like anxiety, depression, and so a lot of things that are like stressing people out. And what what's interesting is there's a connection between the rates of people who have anxiety and depression and the rates of people with heart disease. And so there's before doctors didn't really think there was a connection. Like they thought maybe there's these correlations that happen with people who have anxiety, depression, and also heart disease. But now there's like more research going into the actual connection between those things. And so for certain types of heart disease, um, like heart failure, people actually are more likely to develop anxiety and depression. And so when you think of that link, so when you have like anxiety and depression, you also have higher rates of unhealthy behaviors. And so what we think of when we think of unhealthy behaviors is, you know, smoking, whenever you're stressed out, you might have a cigarette, drinking, that's a depressant, not taking your prescribed medication. So whenever you're doing these things, maybe you're drinking a lot, or maybe you're just kind of forgetful, you might not be taking the medications you want. Or some people might have negative connotations to medication or, um, just don't want to take it and so then they're not taking the prescribed meds that are there to help them and also additionally overeating an unhealthy diet oftentimes like if you think of somebody who's depressed people often have this image of somebody who's like crying like eating a tub of ice cream or something on their bed and so like if you think of that um whenever you're not feeling great like in your mind sometimes you are just like, I'm not feeling great. So I'm just going to kind of do things that maybe make me feel better. Or um, I'm going to have a little bit more grace with myself when I'm going to eat this chocolate cake because I normally wouldn't or something like that. Um, but whenever you do those things, you know, it's about these habits. So if you're doing that once in a while, that's, that's fine. Everything in moderation. But if you're doing that as like a consistent every single day, I had a bad day. I'm going to eat some ice cream. I had a bad day. I'm going to do this you know, those things 
develop as patterns. And the longer you do those things, and the more often you're doing those things, the more effect that they're going to have on your body. And so additionally, when you're eating crappy, you usually feel crappy and you're not really as motivated to get up and work out and kind of move around a little bit. And so maybe if you just ate a whole pint of ice cream, you're not really ready to go on a run <laughs> or I never am anyways. And so it like all of these things are connected. And so whenever I think of like our bodies, I think of like, and just like ourselves as people, like I think of it as a circle. And so like, whenever we think of like our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health, um, and physical and spiritual health, like if one part of your circle or one part of your wheel is deflated, so maybe you're having a really hard time and you're eating really crappy, that's going to affect everything else. You know what I mean? Your stomach starts to feel bad. And once you feel bad, maybe you're feeling bad about your body, then your mind kind of starts to go a little bit too. And you're like, oh, I just feel terrible. And so we really can't run on a flat tire. And so like, you can't just keep going and keep going when maybe you're not taking care of yourself mentally or whenever you're not taking care of yourself physically, that's going to make it so much harder for you to do all the things that you want to do when you're just not a hundred percent. And so it's really important to take care of yourselves and really target and pay attention to yourself and your body and those things that you really need. And so Sometimes whenever people think of like heart health and mental health, a big question that people ask is what's the difference between a panic attack and a heart attack? And some people say you actually can't tell them apart, like when they're in the moment and happening. Some people who are having panic attacks genuinely believe that they're having a heart attack and it feels like they're going to die or it's really hard to breathe. Um, it feels like there's a really heavy weight on their chest. Um, people might have tingling sensations in their bodies. Um, but both of these things, is, it can be associated with instant onset, but the main differences that you should pay attention to are panic attacks will typically come out of nowhere versus a heart attack will typically be after some sort of exertion. So maybe if you're walking a lot or if you're really stressed out, like that's a type of exertion on your body too, right? Because your hormones are really at the top of the level. And so whenever you think of these things, your body can only sustain those things for so long. And so whenever you, like, if you're thinking about, is this a heart attack or is this a panic attack? Typically panic attacks will last anywhere from a few minutes to about 20 to 30. Um, but, and they'll start to get better over time. But with a heart attack, it's typically going to get worse over time. So it's not going to start feeling better. And so, but if you're ever questioning or you're thinking, I would say just go to the hospital because you can never be too safe and sorry. With mental health, um, when you think of mental health, there's a lot of reasons um, when you think of natives and there's like a lot of negative connotations or people like to focus on uh, the, I can't remember what it's called, but when people focus on the negative rather than the positive things, and so you hear, oh, natives have high rates of suicide, natives have high rates of diabetes, high rates of um, heart health, or, you know, all of these things, right? And it can feel really overwhelming to hear all those negative things that are happening, and, and why are these things happening to native people, right? And so when we think about that, some of the specific things um, to native people are like, you think of cultural disruption. So, you know, it's interesting, like in my job, because up until 1978, it was illegal for us to practice our traditional ways. You know, like my dad was alive before that. It was illegal for him to practice those ways. And because of that cultural disruption, and there's so much historical trauma and individual trauma, family trauma that comes from that, uh, it can be really hard to take care of our spiritual selves. And really, we're just trying to get those things back now. And so what I think is really interesting is that, you know, for my dad, it was illegal. But now I'm in a position where I'm literally getting paid to try to bring these things back and to be able to try to learn more about our culture, history, and ceremonies. And so there's like strives for us. But, you know, we take steps so that the next generation can run. So we have to break down those barriers. So for the children, it'll be a lot easier for them to access those things. 
And that's what I'm talking about when I feel like trauma. And so for some people for mental health, heart health, um, they feel like it's not like really safe or like hopeful, supportive, or welcoming to talk about those things. And so for some people, they might feel embarrassed to talk about diabetes or talk about heart health, mental health, because they don't know who to talk to. They're like, oh, if I talk to my auntie about that, she's just going to tease me, tell me to stop eating McDonald's or something like, and so there's just different connotations and all of these things are personalized. So what makes sense for me is going to be different than what makes sense for somebody else. And how can we take care of themselves and the things that they're experiencing are completely individualized. And so, like I mentioned, the heart is the center of the body. It supplies us with oxygen, blood to all of our organs versus our mind, that's the center of our consciousness. It's kind of like the essence of who we are as people. And so when people are experiencing high levels of stress or a really traumatic and like experience or something like that, what will often happen is the flight, fight, freeze response. And so flight, you're gonna run away, fight, you're gonna stand there and fight your ground, freeze, you do nothing at all. And so when you're really stressed out and your body goes into that response, your mind's no longer your mind, right? So what happens is our amygdala is kind of like our emotional center of our brain and our lid kind of gets flipped and we're just acting specifically on like our, um, what's it called? Like just our instincts. And so when you're stressed, your adrenaline goes really high, your cortisol goes really high, your body is just trying to it's, it's doing what it needs to do to keep itself safe, whatever that feels like. And so when you're doing those things and you're feeling really stressed out, those things immediately go to your heart and feel it in your heart. So you feel your heartbeat going really fast and you're trying to slow yourself down. Your blood pressure is really high. Everything's in overdrive. And so this really sets you up for higher risk for your heart health. Because like I mentioned, you know, whenever you're doing these things, your body can only sustain those for so long before it gets exhausted and it shuts down. And so imagine yourself, you're driving 70 down the road, you know, 70, 70, 70 all the time. You're burning a lot more gas than if you'd be going slower. And whenever you're just, you can't do it anymore, that takes a toll. It takes a toll on your heart, takes a toll on your mind, takes a toll on your body. And so you really have to take care of yourself. So when we think of at that point, you might be like emotionally exhausted. You might be really stressed out. Um, I can't see the chat, but if you guys want to feel free, comfortable to, um, you can talk, type in the chat, where do you feel stressed in your body? And so when you're really stressed out, when you're thinking about, oh, I have this, this, and this to do, where does that show up for you? Does that show up in your chest? Does it feel like a ball in your chest? You're really stressed. Does it feel like in your shoulders? I know Erin Nurmi said her shoulders. Mm -hmm. it, it can show up in a lot of interesting ways. Some people, it shows up in their stomachs. The neck, upper back. Mm -hmm. All of those Headache, things. Headaches, stomach issues, sleep problems. I think that this uh, photo right here is a really good way um, to showcase kind of what that emotional exhaustion, exhaustion looks like, what stress looks like for you. And whenever you're thinking about, you know, I'm stressed, but it's okay. Your body will show you that you're stressed. You know, whenever you feel it in your shoulders, when you can't sleep at night, when you're overthinking, when you forget your keys three times in the morning, or you have to run back into the house right before work. Like these things really are present in your life if you're paying attention to them. And that's why it's uh, really the, important to be in tune with your body. What's up, so there was a comment, uh, the stomach, mm -hmm. neck. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And like, what's interesting about it too is that it's so individual. How I feel stress is going to be different than how you feel stress. But even if you feel stress, I feel stress personally in my chest a lot of times. It'll feel like a ball and it feels really, really tight. And maybe that feels like that for some of you guys too, but I'm sure it's going to be a different sensation, right? And so whenever we're thinking of these things, it can feel stressful to talk about stress. And so how do we manage those things? So 
steps to take to help are really recognizing some of the triggers. So like I mentioned, what can you do to tell that you're feeling stressed in your body? That's a really big thing for you. Um, do you notice that when you're getting ready for work in the morning, you're always late? Me. Um, are you like really rushing around the house trying to grab everything and get ready to get in the car and go? What are you, what is kind of showing up in your life that is presenting those triggers? And is there something that you can do about it? So that's for developing support. And so whenever people are developing support, whether that's support for themselves, right? I know I run late in the mornings. I should make a conscious effort to wake up 15 minutes earlier so I have time. That's something that I can do to support myself, to reduce that stress in my life, right? So whenever I'm doing self-support, this can look like a lot of different ways. So maybe, so every morning I get up and I offer tobacco and I know that I'm running late every morning, but I really want to make time for that. Thinking about your priorities and how you're taking care of yourself. I know that offering that tobacco is going to help me out. And so I make a point to do those. And so a few other things you guys can do is therapy. You know, when I say coping skills, a lot of people say that people are like, what are coping skills? So that's like exercising, running, eating healthy, listening to music. Basically the things that you know how to do that help you feel better is what coping skills is. And gratitude. I think oftentimes in today's society, we go really fast and we don't really pay attention to the things that we're thankful for and the things we take for granted. So um, really being, just taking a moment to appreciate something that's going good in your life. And whenever you can't support yourself, really finding others that can support you. So that goes into community resources. So finding programs in your community that can help you, your friends, your family. I'm gonna go to the gym. Maybe we're gonna start a group that's gonna go to the gym or maybe we're gonna start a walking group. I'm going to check in on everybody and see, hey, have you walked this week? Or we're going to start a cooking class together. These are like so many different things where when you reach out and you expand your network, these are more people that you can check in with and hold yourself accountable to who can really check in on you and see how you're doing, whatever you might not be doing that way. Like that great. These are just some more examples of how you manage stress. Meditation is one that um, if we have time switch, I don't want to take too much time, but I do have a meditation activity that. Yeah, so we're probably covering, probably got about three or four minutes left, Peyton. Okay. So I know there was a, another comment about, you know, when they feel stressed, they feel like crying way too much for seemingly no reason. Mm -hmm. There's another one, you know, reduce coffee for anxiety related symptoms. That's a tough one for that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. When you feel like you're crying too much, that's, you know, your body's way of just trying to release those emotions and that stress. And whenever you, you're feeling so overwhelmed, it, you, your emotions will take over and they'll really, it will feel like you're crying for nothing because you, you are, <laughs> like you're just so much in overdrive. And right. So, you know, um, and I know you like, like the point that you brought up coping skills, you know, and it is, it is really important for people to find that coping skill, you know, whatever you're struggling with or whatever problem you have, you know, mm -hmm. it's easy to go smoke a cigarette, it's easy to go uh, drink alcohol, it's easy to go smoke weed, it's easy to go do drugs, you know, just to, to get rid of that stress, but, you know, finding mm -hmm. that other stuff that you could do that yeah. might be healthier rather than adding on to more issues for your heart. Absolutely. And and I know you like, I like the fact too, that you also brought up historical trauma and that's a whole different, different animal. We could, that could be a whole different presentation in itself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I know if you are, if you feel like you got to cry, most of the time you should cry because it's not, not good to hold that in, you know, it's just mm -hmm. your way of releasing that, that tension. So yeah. If you got to cry, you know, cry, you know, uh, growing up as a kid, you know, you're told not to let people see you cry. So you're, you're keeping those emotions in when you should be letting them out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so because we're a little short on time, I'll leave you guys with this. So whenever I say practicing gratitude, these are a couple ways that you could bring it into your life. And whenever you kind of take the time to calm yourself down, that not only helps your mental health, it helps your physical health as well. So 
really taking care of your heart, your mind, your body. And so thinking about the last time you really celebrated your body for what it's able to do. Like you guys, for those who are able, were able to get up and walk and get up and drive your car this morning. You're able to, you know, grab this and drink your water. Your body does these things for you and you take it for granted. You just expect your body to do these things. But when it can't, that's when you really appreciate the things it can do. So really just taking a chance to thank your body for taking care of you. Um, telling yourself something you love about yourself. Positive self-talk is so, so important. Trying to do this at least once a day to really just build that self-love and self-appreciation. Um, that gratitude for somebody else. So maybe you want to write a note to somebody who's had a big impact on your life or a small impact, whatever that looks like for you. Maybe your partner poured you coffee this morning or got you breakfast ready. Or maybe your grandma did something really good for you or raised you or did all these amazing things that really changed your life to where it is today. Just writing a note and delivering that to them and just saying thank you for everything that you've done and how you've impacted my life. And also offering that stuff to the spirits too. The spirits are looking out for you and taking care of you and really just taking that time to offer them some appreciation too and say thank you for looking out for me and guiding me on the things that we're doing. I'll, I'll end it there. Um, are there any questions that we have? Now is the time if anyone has a question for Peyton. Uh, now is the time to ask her. And, you know, Peyton's always willing to take on phone calls or emails. Uh, she's more than willing to help out in any way she can. She's always here for the community. Like I said, you know, I, I really appreciate Peyton. Just the short amount of time. She's done a lot of good stuff. And she was with her willingness to come and do this presentation. For me, you know, I asked her and she's, she's always uh, willing to lend a helping hand, you know, and I know she's always at a lot of the community events that I, that I, that we do for the EHDI grant or whatever, whatever one we do. Uh, she's always there, her and Jay. So, you know, just always thankful that she comes and shows support for programs. So some of the, some of the things, thank you, Peyton. Good job, Peyton. Thank you. Uh, anyone have a question on any of the, yeah, I know it's, uh, it's uh, I know there was a comment here, it's too bad we couldn't have a support group talking circle type of thing uh, for her as a woman, she would appreciate that. You know, that's one thing too, that we're hopefully, we'll get back into being able to do in-person stuff, because I know a lot of times, you know, the people that we have on here now are pretty much staff, you know, there's a couple of people that are not staff that are on here, but we would just like to re do that outreach further, but it's kind of hard when, when people don't have this access or whatnot. So mm -hmm. um, eventually, hopefully we could get back to in doing in-person stuff. Cause I know a lot of people look forward to getting back in person and uh, the people that are, that can do zoom are kind of getting tired of doing zoom. So any other questions for Peyton? No. So I applaud you, Peyton. That was a good presentation. And thank you again. Thanks for inviting me, Squidge. And yeah, if any of you guys have any other questions or anything, feel free to email me. Stop by my office. I'm located in the behavioral health office upstairs. So yeah, thanks. And yep, and if any of our uh, panelists also want to use uh, this time as a plug to, you know, do that as you as needed. You know, it's a web a different uh, way to get your information out there you know what what you're offering or what you're looking to do for the community or whatever you know anything you want to use as a plug our panelists we will you can do that here most definitely so if there's no other questions for Peyton uh any last last second questions for Peyton going once going twice Okay, I guess we'll keep things moving right along here. I know we're on a time frame here. So our next presenter is Becca Adams. She is our community wellness coordinator for Boys Fort. Uh, she will be talking about heart health foods. You know, Becca does personalized plate challenges, food dem demos. She's also done one-on-one -on -one education for nutrition. She has knowledge about traditional foods. I know her and Amber, designed the Minobimadizi plate, which means he, she lives well, 
leads a good life, has a good health plate. Becca, I appreciate your willingness to always provide community outreach, and I'm glad we have our community, our committed teamwork as usual. And um, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with you. So without further ado, um, we will turn it over to Becca Adams. We'll be talking about heart health foods. So whenever you're ready, Becca. Okay. All right, thank you, Squidge. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into it here. All right, thanks, Squidge. I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into it. I have a lot of information to share with you guys today. So, um, so I'm here to talk to you guys about um, how we can take care of your heart through food and hopefully prevent heart disease. And so how much you eat or what you eat is just as important as um, uh, what you eat. And so overloading your plate, um, taking seconds or um, eating until you're stuffed, um, things like those can lead to eating more calories than our body needs. And so an important first step is to um, control our portion sizes and and to know our portion sizes. And so um, I found this image online that I like. It's super helpful in um, remembering portion sizes. And so you can see um, like two handfuls is a salad serving. So if you have, you know, fresh spinach, um, serving a lettuce is, or a serving a lettuce is about two handfuls. And then you can see from the picture, um, a fist is considered a carb serving. So a serving of like mashed potatoes or a serving of rice or a serving of fruits or vegetables. Um, so fist is your carb. Um, the palm, so the palm of your hand, that's gonna be your protein serving. So that's like the perfect portion for like your size of meat. Um, and then you can see the fingertip, the fingertip that is your fat serving. So it's about a teaspoon. So it's your oils, your butter, your mayonnaise, um, a cupped hand. So like if your hand cupped, that's about a snack serving. So it's about a half cup. Um, it's a perfect portion, like if for like dried nuts, um, dried fruit, um, and then your thumb, that's about um, two tablespoons, which is about a good perfect portion for like things like cheeses or peanut butter. Um, some more tips that could help us to control portion sizes is um, just to use a smaller plate or bowl and then uh, just to load up our plates with uh, fruits and vegetables so we're not um, taking up, uh, eating higher calorie foods like meats and cheeses and carbs and stuff. Um, another way we can take care of our heart is to eat more fruits and vegetables. Our fruits and veggies are good sources of vitamins and minerals, um, also low in calories and very rich in fiber. Uh, fiber is very important in uh, preventing heart disease uh, fiber can both uh, lower your blood pressure and your cholesterol. Um, and it also works to like fill you up. So you're eating less, um, eating less junk kind of food. Um, and just a couple tips here to help you eat some more fruits and vegetables. Um, a good tip is to keep your vegetables uh, washed and cut up in your fridge just for quick and easy snacking. And it's a good reminder to, hey, I got these vegetables that are about to go bad. You know, I should snack on those before they go bad. Um, and another way we can do it is just to keep, uh, just keep it visible, you know, keep it, keep fruit in a bowl in the kitchen um, on your table, just as a reminder um, that healthy snacks are easy and readily available. Um, and then just to try to choose recipes that have vegetables or fruits as the main ingredients. So things like stir fries, salads, or soups. Um, and then we can also add fruits or veggies um, to foods you already like. So an example would be um, adding bananas to your cereal, you know, adding uh, blueberries to your salad, uh, for example. Um, another good tip is just to try new things, you know, um, you know, instead of, you know, making regular spaghetti one night, maybe you could spiralize um, a squash, a summer squash, and make zoodles instead. Um, that's a, uh, another good tip. Um, we can also choose whole grains. Um, whole grains are also good sources of fiber and other nutrients that play a role in regulating uh, blood pressure and health. And so you can see I just kind of um, listed some things um, 
to try choose and then some things to avoid. So it was just pretty basic, you know, instead of white bread, we can choose whole grain bread, you know, instead of a high sugary cereal, we can choose one that's high in fiber with five grains, five grams or more of fiber. Um, and so, like I said, instead of, you know, regular spaghetti or regular Mac, you know, we can choose whole grain or um, even try things like barley, uh, you know, uh, things like brown rice, wild rice, buckwheat, quinoa, um, and, you know, choosing whole grain pasta instead of regular pasta. Um, and another way we can care for our heart is just to eat more foods with omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so omega-3s are good for your heart and blood vessels um, in a lot of different ways. Um, they help reduce blood triglycerides. Um, they also help the reduce of developing arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats. Um, and then they could also um, help reduce or slow uh, the buildup of plaque and cholesterol and calcium, all of which um, uh, hardens and blocks your arteries. Um, foods with omega-3 fatty acids, they also help lower your blood pressure. So all of those things are good for heart health. Um, and they're also doing a lot of research on omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and so they're starting to think that omega foods with omega-3 fatty acids, they're starting to think research is starting to show, you know, um, it could possibly help out with cancer, possibly help out with things like, like depression and mental health, uh, inflammation and uh, even ADHD, things like that. So like I said, that's why I like nutrition, you know, it's constantly learning new things and there's still a lot that um, needs to be researched and there's still a lot that needs that can be learned about nutrition. Um, so some sources of omega-3s. So a lot of like, fish are um, good sources of omega-3s. So things like salmon, tuna, trout, sardines. Um, so also plant-based sources include things like flax seeds, uh, flax seed oil, uh, things like walnuts, chia seeds, uh, hemp seeds, canola oil, uh, soybeans, uh, things like that. Um, so omega-3 fatty acid, it's considered um, an essential fat um, because our body can't make it on our own. And so we got to get it from outside sources. And so the American Heart Association, uh, that's why they put out a recommendation that we need to eat um, at least two servings, four ounce um, servings of fatty fish each week. So things like salmon, trout, tuna, um, just so that we're getting um, those omega-3 fatty acids that's, um, that our body needs. Um, just a couple tips for um, getting more omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. Um, you can make your own salad dressing that includes olive or flaxseed oil. Um, another idea is to blend uh, uh, mashed avocado into dips. Um, we can add walnuts to cereal salads, um, walnut oil and salad dressings too. And then also um, things like flax seeds, chia seeds, uh, hemp seeds, um, all of those things can be uh, added to salads. Um, I know I add uh, flax seeds and chia seeds like to my yogurt in the morning or my oatmeal even in the morning. Um, add it to your sauces, like I mentioned, uh, salad dressings. And you can add it to like your baked goods too. So if you're baking, it's very easy to add to your baked stuff too. Um, and so I like this graphic that the American Heart Association put out. It just makes it a whole lot easier um, uh, distinguishing the different fats. And so you can see they organized it, um, the good, the bad, the ugly. So on the far left, you can see the good fats. So those are our monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. So these are our good fats. These are our um, plant-based liquid oils. Um, our canola oil, our olive oil, our avocados, um, our nuts, and our seeds. Um, so these are our good fats. Um, they're good because they can help lower our bad cholesterol levels, um, lower our risk of heart disease and stroke. And like I said, they provide those um, essential fats that our body needs um, and can't produce by itself. Sorry, um, there's a question. It says, is walleye a fatty fish? Um, anything uh they say if it's in cold water it's a, like a fatty it's considered a fatty fish so it would be considered a fatty fish like anything in cold water would be high in those omega-3 fatty acids 
that's a good question. Um, and then you can see in the middle uh, is the saturated fats. So these are um, saturated fats. They usually come from animal sources. So like a lot of come from a lot of meat and dairy products and tropical oils. So these are um, these raise our bad cholesterol levels and lower the good cholesterol. And uh, these are the fats that put us at risk for heart disease and stroke. And that's the reason why the American Heart Association, they, um, they put a recommendation that um, uh, no more than five to 6% of our calories should be coming from saturated fats. And then on the far right, you can see the ugly. So that's the stuff that we should try stay away from and as much as possible. So those are um, our hydrogenated oils. Those are our trans fats. So those are the fats that come from the fried foods, um, the stuff that comes from like Crisco, um, some baked stuff. So these are the stuff that raise our bad cholesterol, lowers our good cholesterol, puts us at risk for heart disease and puts us at risk for stroke. And they can also put us at risk for type two diabetes. Um, um, another way that we can, um, take care of our heart is uh, reducing uh, the salt in our food. So eating too much can lead to high uh, blood pressure, which is a risk factor for heart disease. And um, just limiting how much salt in our diet is an important part of a heart healthy diet. And so that's why the American Heart Association, they recommends that um, no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, which is about a teaspoon of salt. Um, and ideally, they want people to not go over 1500 milligrams. Um, so cutting back on the table salt, you know, cutting back on the salt shaker, um, that helps out. But most of the salt that we eat, most, most of the salt in our diet, it comes from the processed foods. So that's the stuff that we pretty much buy at the store, you know, um, those are uh, the frozen dinners, the soups, the baked goods and stuff like that. Um, um, eating fresh foods and making your own uh, food, um, just so you know how much salt you're putting in your own food. Um, those are all good ways um, to reduce the salt in your diet. And then um, also using herbs and spices to flavor food is a much healthier way than um, salt. So there's another question, Becca. It says, what is yep. your thoughts on intermittent, intermittent fasting? On intermittent fasting? Um, they're still kind of doing, like I'm still, I don't know. <laughs> like they're still doing research on it. So I kind of have like my own little personal opinions and stuff. So, um, but what I've been reading about intermittent fasting is, um, is it works. I mean, I guess whatever works for you, you know, if it works for you, it might not work for everyone else, but, um, but the research behind it is it does work for people. And if I, I just say, you know, if it works for you, works for you. <laughs> um, okay. okay. Um, another way that we can um, take care of our heart through food is choosing low fat protein sources. So things like lean meat, poultry and fish um, and eggs are some of your best sources of protein and just to choose uh, lower fat options. So things like skinless chicken breasts rather than fried chicken, uh, skim milk or rather than whole milk. Um, I mentioned omega-3, so fish, um, especially cold water fish, um, those are going to be a good alternative to the higher calorie meats, the high fat meats, um, uh, legumes. So things like beans, peas, lentils, those are going to be probably the best just because they're, uh, low fat and contain no cholesterol and they are plant-based. So they are a good substitute for meat. Um, and then you can see on the right there, just things, I mean, pretty obvious things to avoid, things that are bad for our heart. Um, a lot of processed meats. So things like our hot dogs and sausages and spam and bacon. Uh, 
And then another way we can take care of our heart is to uh, limit our sugar intake. So consuming too much added sugar can raise blood pressure and increase chronic inflammation, both of which um, can lead to heart disease. And then consuming too much over time can just lead to weight gain, which can, you know, contribute to diabetes. Um, diabetes, we know, um, puts us at risk for developing heart disease. And so just because there is that link, there is that link between sugar and heart disease, the American Heart Association, they put out, um, they put out this recommendation. So they put out um, for men, for men to consume no more than nine teaspoons or 36 grams or 150 calories per day. And then for women, you know, we see it six grams or six teaspoons or 25 grams or hundred calories. Um, and just a side note on that, if you were to look at the nutrition facts panel on like a can of pop, you would see that um, you're going way over your limit already just by drinking one can of pop. You're already going your daily, you're already going over your daily limit for sugar. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there, just how much sugar, people don't realize how much sugar we actually um, consume. Um, and then just a couple other heart, another tips to prevent heart disease, just to, um, we can try different ways of cooking food. So things like baking, broiling, grilling, uh, steaming, air frying, uh, poaching, just to add some variety. Um, and then a, another good tip is just to plan ahead, you know, um, plan meals ahead of time, uh, looking up, uh, trying new recipes. Um, I know the American Heart Association, they have um, on their website, they have a list of um, heart healthy recipes. Uh, uh, another tip is just eliminating or avoiding alcohol. Um, and then we know that tobacco, commercial tobacco, um, is a contributor to our heart disease and um, avoiding secondhand smoke is good for preventing heart disease too. Um, and then uh, just getting enough exercise, you know, burning, burning the calories that we're taking in, um, aiming for at least 150 minutes of moderate physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity and that's a week you know and it does that doesn't have to be all at once you know so like 150 minutes that could be breaking up into 15 minutes in the morning 15 minutes in the afternoon and if you do that every day for five days you know that's 150 minutes um and then I just wanted to point this out um you guys probably seen this logo um, like on menus or maybe when shopping in the grocery stores, um, but it's a logo that the American Heart Association put out. Um, and it's just an easy way for um, the average person, the consumer, the shopper to know that that food is heart healthy and they're not trying to trick you. Um, and what this logo means is it just basically means is that food went through certain standards um, to be certified as heart healthy. And so it basically means that um, it has to have a good source of, new, of beneficial nutrients that are naturally occurring, um, has to be limited in sodium, and then has to be limited in bad fats. And so I just wanted to point that out, you know, you guys probably seen that logo before, but it just means that that food is guaranteed to be heart healthy because it went through American Heart Associations, their standards for healthy eating. Yeah, and that's pretty much all I have for you guys. I can't really see any questions, so. Okay, I got the here. question to you back if people have okay. it. Okay. So I'd like to thank you again, Becca. You know, your presentations are always good. You always have good information on how people could improve their heart health. You know, I know uh, just the stuff that I've gotten from you, you know, I, I do utilize the, the chia flax and the hemp seeds in my uh, morning shakes and you know that does help that does help improve my cholesterol um, so if anyone has any questions for Becca now is the time to ask them and like I said Becca you know she's always willing to do one-on-one -on -one. I know she's done uh, her and Amber do food, uh, cooking classes uh, except she designed the 
the my plate in our Ojibwe Muin, which has some really good information on there. And you guys still have uh, copies of those, Becca? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And like I said, those are those are really good stuff on there, you know, has a breakdown of our traditional food, uh, activities, you know, what activities, how much calories you'll burn. And it's pretty detailed on the back too. So does anyone have any questions for Becca? You know, I like the fact that we're able to provide a conference for our, our people here that are on, you know, I, I really like that we would really hope that we'd be able to get more people. Like I said, you know, for target people is under 40 each time, you know, that, that's still good stuff. Um, and the fact that we're able to use our own, our own employees and our own people from our community, you know, is really good stuff. So I always appreciate you. Uh, there's a problem, uh, comment out there, Becca says, good information, thanks. Like I said, you know, Becca's always willing to, always come and provide education whenever I ask her. And I always appreciate that, mm -hmm. Becca. And uh, I always look forward to our teamwork that we've done. And I know we've done a lot of stuff over the last couple of years. And like I said, hopefully we'll get back to in-person stuff. So anyone else have any last, last minute questions for Becca? If not, we'll move right along. Our next presenter is uh, Fitness Center. So myself and Kristen Strong. Um, so I'll be talking about a little bit. Before we do some exercise, I'll show you. I'm going to have a quick little stuff I'd like to talk about, you know, why exercise for a healthy heart. So regular exercise has many benefits. You know, it could strengthen your heart and cardiovascular system, improve your heart failure symptoms, increase energy levels. You can do more activities without becoming tired or short of breath. It increases endurance, lower blood pressure, improve muscle tone and strength, improve balance and flexibility, help lose or maintain weight, helps reduce stress, tension, anxiety, and depression. So... How, how do you get started? You know, before starting an exercise pro program, talk to your doctor. You know, fitness is a journey. We all have to start somewhere. Uh, you know, talk about safe exercises. Get the doctor's approval before you start. Uh, medication changes. Medications can greatly affect your response to exercise. Your doctor can tell you if normal exercise routine is still safe. What types of exercise are best? Cardiovascular and aerobic strength and stretching. What should your program include? Like Becca said, you know, 150, you'd want to aim for 150 minutes per week. But generally, it should start up with a warm up. You know, that might include walking, jogging, biking five to 10 minutes before you start your exercise program, strength training, lifting weights, improve strength and build muscle. Amount of extra amount for this exercise should be at least 20 to 45 minutes, depending on how hard, how hard you want to go. Cardio, cardio training, which we'll be doing a demonstration of some cardio training here in a little bit. So that's walking, jogging, running, jump roping, bicycling, stationary outdoors, cross country skiing, rowing, low impact water aerobics, and body weight exercises. This could be done for 30 to 60 minutes. You know, for beginners, it should be broken down to 10 minute increments three times a day. If you're just starting. Stretching, stretch the arms and legs before and after exercising to help injury and strain. This also increases flexibility, posture, and range of motion. The cool down should, should be done at the end of your exercise and probably consists of the same thing you do as your warm up. So how often should you exercise for a healthy heart? At least three to four times a week. Um, you'd wanna try shoot for at least 60 minutes if you can in 150 minutes per week, uh, make time for exercise. You know, there's a 24 hour day. So, you know, there's a uh, eight hours for work. You know, you have drive time, whether if you live an hour away, so that'd be two hours. Uh, just like I said, making time, there's eight hours for sleep time. So after breaking down, breaking down a full day, you know, with uh, dinner time, family time, TV time, out of 24 hours, there's at least an hour a day left that could be left for exercise time. So hear your heart, love your health, and make time for exercise. So there are some precautions for exercise. You know, stop exercising if you come, become overly fatigued or short of breath. Discuss this with your provider or your doctor. 
Do not exercise if you are not feeling well or have a fever or COVID. Wait until your symptoms are gone before you start your restarting your exercise program. If you experience pain, don't ignore it. If you have chest pain or pain anywhere else in your body, stop the activity. If you feel dizzy or lightheaded, have unexplained weight gain or weight loss, call the doctor as soon as you can. Or if you have any other symptoms that cause for concern. So without further ado, we will go right into our exercises. And I'd like to thank uh, Kristen Strong. You know, she's always uh, doing our demos for our exercises. You know, Kristen, I'd like to applaud Kristen as well. She manages both fitness centers in Net Lake and Vermeil and Wellness Center. Uh, she said she's always willing to demonstrate her exercise for our sponsored events. And she always goes above and beyond, making sure both facilities are open, having supplies stocked and clean for participants to use. So with that, Kristen, I will thank you. So we will uh, adjust our camera so Kristen could demonstrate some exercises. No. The first one, these are just some cardio exercises that, that can be done. You know, just if you're at work and you get feeling a little bit tired. So the first one, you know, you could do some jump squats. You'd want to probably try to do at least four to ten, two to three, two to three sets. That's what a, a jump squat looks like. Uh, and if you can't do regular push-ups, you could always start with wall push-ups or incline push-ups. So next you'll move to a uh, incline push-up. So if you're just starting to learn, if you're beginning, to, if you can't do a push-up, you know, you'd want to build up, build up so you could do regular push-ups. So this is a good way to start with push-ups. You'd want to do three, three sets to 25 reps. So those are some incline push-ups, and that's what a wall push-up looks like. Next, we'll be doing some knee-high runs. First, you could modify it if you're just beginning, so you just start with a knee-high walk. Uh, if you're a little bit advanced, you don't want to go into a slowly jog. And then if you're very active, like Kristen is, you could go in right into a run. Next, we'll be doing some dips. So this is a modified dip. You would a tricep dip. So this is uh, modified. So she'll be standing up with her knees bent and she just dips down. She'll be working her triceps. Next, she will be doing an in and out squat. This one's a little bit tricky. This is a little bit for advanced people. So what she'll be doing is she'll be holding a squat pose. Then she's just gonna kind of like she's doing jumping jacks in and out. This is good for her hamstrings and her glutes and her quads. And she'll go into a butt kicks. Uh, this, this one, if you're just starting out, you'll just kind of walk it out. As you're a little bit advanced, you would go into a slow jog and to all out sprint. Next one, she'll be doing a wood chop. This is just to get your body moving. Just kind of like she's splitting wood. And if she wants to go a little bit advanced, she could really split that wood. And now next, she'll have to do her wood, wood toss. So it's kind of like she's picking up wood. This one's just getting your, your lower legs moving, your upper body moving. Just a good way to get get everything moving. Next one is called a cross jack, which is a jumping jack. So this one, her palms will be facing each other. And as she's crossing, she's gonna alternate her hands, which is why it's called a cross jack. So yeah, so she's alternating hands as she's doing it. Probably wanna go a little bit more to your side. There you go. And if you're just starting, you could at least, you could walk it out too. You could just do a sidestep for a moderate mod modify it, yeah. That's a modified version. Cross jack, and then she'll finish with some punches. Like I said, all this is just to get everything moving. This is just exercise you could do right at work. 
And uh, I'm pretty sure Kristen will tell you, I'm pretty sure her heart is going. Yeah, I'm sweating. Oh, I forgot a hair tie. Oh, I'd like to thank Kristen for doing that demonstration for us. I was glad that she's willing to demonstrate our site for us. Um, so we do have some nice prizes lined up. We have, sorry, I got my notes all over here. So we have nine care packages, which include some hygiene items. It's uh, shampoo, soap, um, toothpaste, toothbrush, lotion. Uh, we also have some heart health food packages. We have 10 of those for our participants. That includes a case of water, some old fashioned oats, some, some Cheerios and some nuts and some tea. Uh, we also have uh, from Peyton's program, we have the culture healing program. She has a slow cooker with indigenous food stories and recipe cookbook. She has a painting with a smudge kit. Uh, there's also a Gitchigami heart book with a smudge kit. Our community wellness program divided cook, cookware kit. There's two of those. From our suds program, we have a wool blanket with a coffee mug and tote bag. They also donated a plush towel and a weave mug. We also have, you know, if you're on the go and you have electricity, we have a electric burner with a pan. We have two of those. We have a beverage dispenser. We have two of those we, for when you want to do like water, few fruit infusion water. We have a food chopper. We have two of those. We have an ultimate blender. We have two of those. We have two slow cookers. We have two sets of three cast iron pans. We have two Serta pillows, two Emerald air fryers. Our tobacco station program donated a wireless earbuds with a Yeti cup. They also donated a Bluetooth speaker and a beverage refrigerator. Uh, we also have some, uh, this is what our shirts look like. If, if you, if you, Look at it. Okay, we're having a little bit difficulty. You can't see our shirt. So, without further ado, we'll move right along into our next presenter. Our next presenter is Dr. Dury. He is one of our main providers here at Boys Fort. And um, I know that I always see his car. He's here early and he's one of the last ones to leave. So, everybody, thank you for always being here for our community. And I want to say miigwech for offering to provide our community with some community outreach. And Dr. Dury will be talking about how the heart works. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. William Dury. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm just gonna get this thing going. And can you? Because I don't really see what you see, so I'm not sure. Can you see that whole slide, or are the pictures in front of it? Yes, I can see them. Okay. Okay. So first, I just want to thank you, Squidge, for uh, for uh, my being able to be a part of this uh, conference. I really appreciate it, um, and I appreciate all the work that you have done organizing the athletic activities and conferences and so forth. That's so important in it. Uh, yeah, it kind of goes without saying, but thank you. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me or haven't met me, I'm uh, Dr. Bill Dury. I'm originally from New Jersey. I moved out to Minnesota uh, in 1995, did my medical training in New York and in Minneapolis. And I've been here for about coming up on a year, uh, two years and a half now, two and a half years. Before that, I was with Essentia Clinic uh, as the town doc in Chisholm before they close that clinic. So today's uh, uh, conference, because it's uh, American Heart Month, it's on uh, healthy heart. And this is an especially important one. I think all the health conferences are, are important. This is especially important. And it's because uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease is one of the, is the leading cause of death in the US. Now I use the 2019 statistics because those had just been finalized last July, but 
23% of deaths were, were related to heart disease. And that's between one out of four and one out of five. Uh, a close second is cancers, all kinds of cancers. And then there's a huge step off when we get to the other um, causes of death um, with accidents being 6% and everything else being lower than that. I know people are wondering, well, where does COVID fit in? Of course, in 2019, that wasn't a factor. In 2020, uh, it, it had zipped all the way up to third place. It was 10% of deaths. Now, these numbers represent all races in the United States. And so I was wondering if this accurately represented uh, Native American data. And in fact, up to 1980, uh, Native Americans were, were underrepresented or underreported in that data. And they started uh, a research group in 1988 called the Strong Heart Study out of the University of Oklahoma that's specifically focused on Native American health and in particularly heart disease. And they are um, mostly working out of North and South Dakota, working with tribes out of North and South Dakota, Arizona, and Oklahoma. Um, they work very closely with the uh, tribal councils and they come up with really good data that contributes to the national database. Uh, they're still doing studies. They do a lot of uh, ongoing studies looking at genetics and family patterns. So they, they follow a lot of families over a good number of years. And they've got some, some pretty important information. And, and one of the big things is that Native Americans are disproportionately affected by cardiovascular disease. Uh, it seems to develop at an earlier age. When they looked at uh, Native Americans from North and South Dakota between the ages of 45 and 64, this is pre-retirement age, their mortality rate was twice as high in Native Americans. And in Alaska, in the 25 to 44 year old age group, it's a 30% higher mortality rate uh, attributable just to heart disease. In uh, the slightly older bracket, it's a 40% higher mortality rate. And they're, they're trying to determine why that is. And they do see a correlation with uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cholesterol. So this is why heart health is important. Um, one third of cardiovascular deaths are happening before the age of 65. That's big. You know, you, you work your life hoping that you get some time, more time with your family when you retire. A third of these deaths are happening before that. Most of these are due to coronary artery or heart disease. And the, the bottom line is that the risk can be reduced. Okay, we're never going to eliminate it. There's some things that you can't change. But there's a lot of factors there, and, and we've heard about some of them today, excellent presentations by Peyton and Becca and Squidge, um, ways that you can improve your heart health and, and improve your, your longevity and the quality of life that you have. So uh, like Squidge said, I'm going to be talking about the heart. And um, after I talk, Jen Kober is going to give a presentation. She's with cardiology at Essentia, and she's going to talk about uh, specific types of heart disease, you know, the effects of cholesterol or arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, what's congestive heart failure, that sort of thing. And what I wanted to do was kind of give the background of uh, what's going on with the heart, the basic function and anatomy, so you can see, you know, where these processes are happening, what's actually going on. Um, the electrical system, uh, which is how the heart uh, beats and importantly, the blood supply to the heart. And then if we have time, I wanted to go through how heart function is measured and tested and kind of give you the behind the curtain view of, of really what, what's an echocardiogram, you know, what's a, what's a stress test and, and what's an angiogram. And Squidge, if there's time at the end, I do have a video um, of a complete angiogram. It is 16 minutes long though. And if that's too much, that's fine. I can just leave the link but it is actually interesting for people who have wondered what, what that involves. Yeah, I'd like to see that too. So um, it is, it's I'll interesting. Just quick run and just make sure what, uh, how much time we have as far as IT set us up for the webinar. So yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure that will make it work. So I'll, I'll check back and then I'll, I'll get back to you and let you know when 
just keep going to your presentation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. just slide me down if I'm getting too long. That's a perfect way to do that. So the heart, basic anatomy of the heart. There's there's three layers. Okay, we don't really think of the heart as three layers. We just think of what that picture is there. But there's a layer outside uh, of the heart called the, the pericardium, and this is a sac. It looks like that, um, and that sac has a very important function. Um, it holds the heart. It's anchored to structures inside the chest so that when we're running around or standing on our head, the heart's not flopping all over the place, okay? So it, it contains it, but it has other functions too. It has this very tough outer layer here, and then it's got a very thin, slippery inner layer that's right against the heart muscle. This is the heart muscle here. In between it, there's a small amount of fluid, and that fluid is like a lubricant. So the heart can beat and it's like it's in a kind of like it's in a greased bag. So there's no resistance. It can beat and, and not be rubbing or chafing against anything. That also can be a source of problems. And I'm not going to talk about problems in this, in this uh, slide, but if that were to fill up with fluid abnormally, that could compress the heart. And, and those are things that, uh, that we watch for and test for. So the pericardium has that. There's three layers, like I said, the outer thick protective layer. The inner layer, which just hugs the outside of the muscle of the heart, and then the inner uh, open sac that's got a small amount of fluid in it normally, and that's what it looks like around the heart. The next layer in the heart is the muscle, right? That's what we just think of as the heart itself, because the heart is made up of muscle. Um, this is the thickest layer, and contraction of that muscle is what provides the pump to pump blood through the, the body. The inner layer is called the endocardium, and that's just like this really thin, slippery, smooth lining um, that allows blood to flow through the heart without hanging up on the heart. It just it, um, reduces friction. And the conduction system, which uh, allows the electrical signals to, to travel through the heart, allowing contractions, happens just on the inside of that uh, endocardium that runs in that, in that layer. So when we think about the myocardium and the heart as we know it, when we think of the heart, <clears throat> it's divided into four chambers. You wanna think of it as two sides. There's that blue side, which is, they call that the right side of the heart because the heart's actually facing us. And then the left side, um, we'll look at the top of the heart first. The right atrium is right here. Now, this is the, the area where blood collects when it's coming back to the heart. All the oxygen's been used up, so it needs to be uh, resupplied with oxygen. So that enters this atrium through two blood vessels. One is the superior vena cava, which drains the head and neck and arms. And then inferior vena cava is the rest of the body. Everything from the legs to the, the gut, the intestines, everything comes up this way. And that just collects the blood there. The left atrium, which is the top chamber on the other side, that's also collecting blood, but it's blood that's coming back from the lungs. And that's freshly oxygenated blood. From the atria, it gets pumped into the ventricles. And these are the muscular parts of the heart that kind of do the, the heavy lifting. The right ventricle is accepting the deoxygenated blood and it's gonna pump it to the lungs. That's all the right side of the heart uh, does basically is pump blood to the lungs where it gets recharged, reoxygenated. The left ventricle, this is the strongest ventricle of the two because it's going to pump and uh, send blood throughout the entire body. Okay, it's receiving blood from the top part here from the atrium into the ventricle, pumps it out into the aorta and through the entire body. Now, the heart, when I was thinking about what kind of pump the heart is, it's like the bulb pump on an outboard motor, okay? When you're priming the outboard, you squeeze it, but you don't have to worry about which way the fuel is going to go because it's always going to go in the right direction. And that's because of valves. There's, there's two valves for each ventricle, okay? This one, if we just look at the right side of the heart here, the, the tricuspid valve allows flow into the ventricle. And then when the ventricle contracts, that's gonna increase pressure in there. It's gonna blow that valve closed, okay? And that's like a parachute. 
And actually, because the contraction is so strong, this valve has to be supported by these anchors here. Um, those are chordae tympani, but they're like parachute cords. And that pushes the blood out then through this valve. And when the ventricles finished squeezing the blood out, the pressure will obviously go down because the heart starts to relax. And then the backflow here will close this valve. So it prevents blood from filling up the ventricle again. So it's all one way flow through the chambers and through the body. Like I mentioned, there's four valves. Um, the ones that prevent backflow from the ventricles are the ones that have these extra strong cords on to prevent them from, you know, when you get that um, impulse from the ventricle, it, it prevents it from backflowing. <clears throat> this is what it would look like at work. And what you're hearing when you hear heart sounds are actually the valves closing. Okay, the first sound you hear is when the ventricle contracts and pushes this valve closed. And you'll notice it's at the same time as this valve. So when ventricles contract, you hear that lub of the lub dub. Okay? They push the blood out here. And when this snaps shut, that's the second heart sound. Okay, and ordinarily you'll see that the, you guys can see my arrow, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. So these ordinarily would, would be opening and closing at the same time, and these would open and close at the same time. So that's why you don't hear separate sounds from these two valves, but they sound as, as one valve. And I'll point out that when the ventricle contracts and pushes the blood out, it normally is pushing out about 60% of the volume of blood that's in that ventricle. So we've got a beating heart, but what makes it, what makes it beat? Well, that's the electrical system or the conducting system because heart muscle will contract in response to electrical current, okay? Just like if you had a, a direct current shock, it would cause you to, to, to contract your hand like that. <clears throat> so the same thing here, when you run a current through heart muscle, it just causes it to contract. Um, the, we'll go through kind of the patterns, but it's not like the same electricity you get off a battery, okay? It's, it's specialized cells that um, depolarize in a process called action potentials. And, and really what's important here are sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride, what we talk about as electrolytes when we check electrolyte levels. Um, it's important to keep those within certain ranges because those are important for normal function of the heart. Okay, the conduction system in the heart are a series of specialized cells which transmit electrical impulses but they're not nerves. Okay, they're different than nerves elsewhere in the body. Um, and they're located, like I said, primarily in that uh, deep layer uh, adjacent to the muscle on the inside. Cardiomyocytes are the heart muscle cells, and they're also able to transmit the signal okay, to cells that are adjacent to them. It just doesn't go as quickly uh, from one heart muscle cell to the next, but it does propagate the. Uh, the signal so that they all can contract together. So this, this actually gets kind of cool here, but that's, that's just me. Um, how, do we, how do we get that signal started through the heart? And it all starts with a collection of very specialized cells called the sinoatrial node. And these cells are pacemaker cells, which means they spontaneously, their job is to just spontaneously create pulses of electrical activity, okay? That's independent of the brain, which means that the heart, if it's provided with oxygen, can beat outside of the body, okay? These cells will just keep beating as long as they're getting oxygen. And they go between 60 and uh, 100 beats per minute. You can speed it up uh, with activity, some other, you know, outside factors, you know, that we do, uh, fear, uh, Exercise can increase your heart rate. Sleep, meditation can decrease the heart rate, but you can't turn the heart rate on and off. So it goes 60 to 100 beats per minute. And this is 100,000 beats every day. And, you know, when I first heard that, I, I, I had to recalculate that because it seemed like a lot. But this is, this is what taking something for granted, I think, is all about. Our heart is doing this 100,000 times a day on average without 
a 15 minute coffee break without uh, a vacation, without a snow day, 100,000 beats every day. And that's, to me, there's reason enough that we should try to take care of it. Um, so then from this current, we start up here on the SA node and it's gonna run through these conduction pathways. And as it runs through there, it's causing the atria to, um, to contract, okay? Now, the only place that current gets from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart is through this very specific channel called the AV node. There's a, like a cartilage ring here, which acts as an insulator preventing current from just flowing freely through the heart. So current has to go through that node. It can only go in one direction. So for the electrical people, it's kind of like a diode because if you had current that could go both ways, there would be chaos here, okay? But this is really, really well designed. Current comes down here, can only go through one way, can only go through here. Not only that, but there's a little delay when it passes through the AV node. Why is that? That's so that the atria can finish contracting and pump a little extra blood into the ventricles before the ventricle beats, okay? because you wanna maximize the blood that's in here before you push it through the lungs or to the body. And this little delay allows these upper chambers to pump that blood into the lower chamber before the ventricles contract. And although the atria is just a small little extra boost, you know, there's no valve on the inlet of the atria, so you know, there's a little bit of both directions flow, that little extra boost that the atrium gives with that contraction increases your cardiac output by up to 20 to 30%. Okay, that's a significant amount. From here, okay, now the electrical transmission is gonna go down the, the septum between the two ventricles, okay, and it splits into two branches. And when it gets down here, it'll turn and then run up the outside of the heart. Okay, so the signal kind of runs down the border between the right and left, and then it runs up the outside. These fibers down here, these conduction fibers are very specialized and they transmit the electrical impulse very quickly. It's 150 times faster than, than it passes through here. And it's about six times faster than transmission through the muscle itself. So that's the electrical system and now we had the pump, but now how do we keep it alive? Well, the heart uh, has to get a blood supply from somewhere. I remember a long, long time ago, I used to think, well, the heart's in the middle of pumping all this blood. That's to be where it gets its blood supply, but it, it's not. Uh, that blood is flowing through and really not interacting much with the, with the heart at all. The heart has to have its own blood supply through its own arteries. Um, and those arise from the base of this big vessel, the aorta, which is the one that goes to the whole body. Now, if you remember, there's a valve, uh, when the ventricle pumps blood out, there's a valve that keeps it from kicking back. And these arteries come out uh, right past that valve. So they're right on the other side of that valve. And it's only two of them. There's probably some you know, variations. People might be born with an anomalous artery, but by and large, there's only two arteries that feed the whole heart. And that's the left main, which comes across here and the right uh, coronary artery. The left main, and I'm going into detail here because I'm not sure what Jen is going to uh, talk about in her talk, but uh, if you've known anybody or if you've had an angiogram or a heart attack before um, and you've had a blockage, they, they tell you where the blockage is. You know, you, you, um, you may get a stent and they'll say, well, we had the stent, the circumflex, or whatever. I just wanted to review this so you kind of have an idea that, that this is all out there and it's not, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's not really a mystery. So left anterior descending here, uh, which is the branch down here of the left main, this will supply the front and bottom of the left ventricle. Left ventricle, remember, really important. It's the powerhouse doing the heavy lifting, pumping blood to the whole body. So you don't want blockages in here. Um, the other artery sweeps over here and that's the circumflex and that supplies the atrium and the side and the back of the left ventricle. On the other side, the right coronary artery has two main branches. Uh, we've got the posterior descending, which you uh, sweeps kind of up the back. You can't see it. 
um, and then you've got the right marginal artery. And those provide blood supply to the right ventricle, which is the one that pumps blood to the lungs, the septum between the two ventricles, and uh, the right atrium, as well as those two nodes that generate the impulse. Okay, so they're really you know, important also because you've got to supply blood to that sinoatrial node so that you can generate your impulses. And you have to supply blood to that AV node so that you can conduct that, that impulse into the ventricle. So very specialized purposes for both of these arteries. Now, I thought I would spend a little bit of time, uh, like I had mentioned, kind of going through how the heart, how do we test the heart? Why do we do it? Um, and if we have time, we'll, we'll get to that video. Um, I'll start with an EKG, kind of the most uh, basic. Uh, EKG just records electrical signals of the heart. Okay, we'll get a picture like this, and I'm actually going to explain what all those represent. Um, EKG is commonly done. It's painless. Uh, we do it here in the clinic. It's done in hospital rooms. It's you know a mobile cart. You can push it around uh, and to get an EKG. These are standard equipment in operating rooms. Ambulances have them. Uh, ambulances nowadays, most of them have what's called a transmitting ECG. Uh, machine, which means they can do an ECG in the field and then transmit that result right to an emergency room uh, where it can be interpreted. Some smartwatches have a basic uh, ECG feature. Um, my Apple Watch uh, can do that. You uh, start a tracing. It does not give you a 12 lead like this, but it gives you probably one lead like this one down here. And although you can't tell if you're having a heart attack, it can tell you if your heart rate is irregular. And if you uh, might be experiencing atrial fibrillation or something like that. Oh, and I'll just mention, I say ECG, you hear EKG commonly. Uh, it stands for electrocardiogram and the German for cardio begins with a K and somehow it caught on a long time ago that it was uh, EKG, but they're interchangeable. So why do we do an EKG? Well, it's used to diagnose a lot of heart conditions in people of all ages. Um, it can detect abnormal heart rhythms. It can show changes that might suggest a, an artery might be blocked, leading to chest pain or, or a heart attack. It can tell if you've had a previous heart attack frequently. Um, and it can look for abnormal conduction patterns in the heart. You can see some structural abnormalities like heart enlargement uh, on an EKG too, and some heart defects, usually the conduction defects. You might need one. If you've had chest pain or dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, heart palpitations or uh, weakness, fatigue, trouble doing things that you used to do easily, but now you're getting all short of breath, a good starting place could be an EKG. There's uh, really no risks associated with an EKG. And, and you know, when, when we talk about side effects of things, I, I usually never say never because everybody's different, but this is really a safe procedure. There's no risk of a shock because EKGs don't produce electricity. They only record electrical activity in the heart. Sometimes people will, will get discomfort because the adhesive pads stick really well. So taking them off is like can, taking off a Band-Aid. And you can, some people will have a reaction to adhesive. But other than that, very safe procedure. If you were to have an EKG, um, it can be done in, in the clinic office. Usually a nurse will do it or a technician. They may have you change into a gown. Um, if you have hair on parts of the body where they have to put the electrodes, they might have to shave that off so the patches stick. But once you're all set, you lay on the examining table. The 10 electrodes are attached with sticky patches. You can breathe normally. Sometimes they'll ask you to hold your breath, but that's so that you hold still. You do need to keep kind of quiet. Um, and then a routine EKG only takes a, a few minutes, if that. Now, I debated whether or not I should put this in because it can look complicated on the surface. But I wanted to add this because this is the most interesting thing about EKGs, is what, what those tracings really are. Okay, so you know those electrodes that are stuck on your chest. There's six of them that go across the front of your chest. And then there's four that are called limb leads and they can go on by your shoulders and on your lower uh, belly or on your legs. What the, what the computer is doing is it's just recording impulses as it detects them. Okay, it just records them and then it's going to process them. And it kind of processes them 
like I I like to think of it as like those, remember those flip books? You could flip through the book and, and if there was a stick figure in it, you could see him move and stuff. Well, let's say you had a flip book of a, of a ping pong ball moving across a page, okay? So that's kind of what an EKG machine does is it determines with all these leads where the signal is, where the electrical current is, and then it processes it based on uh, 12 different perspectives. Like if you're sitting in 12 different places, I'm just gonna zip ahead here, okay? So if don't worry about all these lines and all that, but that is kind of what I'm talking about. We wanna look at what the current is doing through the heart here, okay? So let's say I'm sitting over here by the number two, by the Roman numeral two. So if current is coming toward me, that will be represented by an EKG line that goes upward, okay? If it's going away from me, and remember, I'm sitting over here on lead two. If it's going away, it will make the line go down. So let's look at this. Our current is going to start at the SA node here. And I'm sitting over here. It is where lead two was, remember? So I'm sitting over here. When the current's coming toward me, this line will deflect up a little bit. Now that's in an atrium. It's not particularly fast, but it's going up. Then it's going to kind of settle out as it travels through the atrium and come down. Then it's going to pass through the, the AV node, okay? And as it shoots down here, it's going to come toward me really fast. Remember, I said those are really fast conductors. So when, when current comes toward me on an EKG, the line goes up. So this line is going to shoot up. And remember, when the current gets to the bottom here, it turns and goes back up the sides of the ventricle, and that's away from me. So now the current is gonna shoot down, okay? Then we're gonna level out after everything is, is done with that beat. And then this little wave here represents the ventricle getting ready for the next beat, okay? It's repolarizing, it's recharging for the next beat. Okay, so now, this is why that's important, is that we can get that, that report for all 12 of these perspectives. Now there's, Five of them here in blue lines, six of them in blue lines. The other six are in this plane that's not uh, parallel to the front of my body, but parallel with the floor, and that's these V leads. That's, you don't need to know that. But what we're doing is getting 12 different perspectives so we can see what the current in the heart is looking like from 12 different viewpoints, okay? So if we saw, if we look at um, what we had in lead two, which is this, if we now look at AVR, that lead, we should see something nearly opposite, right? Because when current is moving toward two, it's moving away from AVR. Well, let's just take a peek at that. Here's lead two, it goes up, and here's AVR, and it shoots down. See how that? So that's just a different viewpoint of the same thing. And all these are, lined up so the vertical lines are all happening at the same time. So that's what we are looking at when we're looking at an EKG. And we can tell from that normals and not normals. This is a normal EKG. This is an abnormal EKG. This is an inferior MI. And I'll point out what the difference is. If you look specifically in this lead three here, we have the current going through the ventricle toward us and then away. And it comes back to this baseline, and then you get a re recharging. If we look at the abnormal in lead three, it kind of goes down first instead of up. Then it shoots up, but it doesn't come down to baseline. It stays up here. And there's very specific patterns that we can look for and, and, and tell what's going on in the heart and where. So this happens to tell me that it's in the inferior part of the heart. There's also changes up here. This line is too low. That's in the posterior part of the heart. Now we've learned a little bit about the circulation and we know that is fed, this is primarily fed by the right coronary artery and that's where the problem likely is. So more information than you probably wanted to know, but I think that's a really interesting thing about EKGs. An echocardiogram, this is when we actually get to look at the heart work, okay? And this is an echocardiogram machine. There's different styles, but this thing is a, it's called a transducer. It's like a microphone, but it also generates sound waves. You can't hear them. 
but it generates sound waves. So it's kind of like the way a bat echolocates stuff. It bounces the sound waves off of the heart and you, and you actually see the echo. Um, so uh, you can actually see the heart as it's working. It's not even still, still shots. You can actually see kind of movies of it. There are several kinds of echocardiograms. There's a routine transthoracic echo when they put the transducer or the microphone right on your chest. That's kind of the one I was going to look at here. Um, there's a transesophageal echo if they need to get a really close look at one particular aspect of the heart. This is on a with a scope that actually they pass down your throat through your esophagus because the esophagus runs right next to the heart. So they're getting kind of an unobstructed, detailed view. That's called a TEE or a transesophageal echo. A stress echo is when you do an echo looking at heart function when you're putting it through the paces, when you're making it work harder, because you want to see if it can keep up when there's an increased need for uh, oxygen. So why do we do them? Well, checking for problems with the valves or checking for problems with the chambers of the heart. Um, to check if the heart function is the cause of symptoms such as shortness of breath or chest pain. You know, if you can't, uh, walk to the mailbox anymore like you used to because um, you're getting so short of breath. Well, maybe it's because your heart's not pumping strongly enough. And we can see that uh, usually with an echo. And also evaluate abnormal heart sounds. If anybody's ever been told, yeah, you have a cardiac murmur, what a murmur means is just that you can hear the flow of blood. And most commonly, that's because a valve is getting stiff or getting calcified. Um, and you can actually see what's going on. Uh, with an echo, you can actually see the, the blood flow because they, they do, uh, they can colorize it so you can see it better. Are there risks with an echo? Once again, I'm going to say there's, there's really none. Um, and, and I don't usually say zero. I say everybody's different. But there's really none with a standard transthoracic echo. You might have some discomfort because they have to press the uh, transducer on your chest, but they're not pressing it really hard. They just need to get it snug to get good images. Risks of a stress echo are really the risks associated with the exercise that causes the stress or the medication that replicates the stress condition. You know, the medications would speed up your heart rate. Um, so if you were getting chest pain when you're, you know, going for a jog, could you get one with a stress test? You could get chest pain with that too. Um, usually if people have, uh, side effect like a temporary irregular heartbeat, this will stop as soon as you stop the exercise. And serious complications like a heart attack are extremely rare. And when they do stress tests, they always have somebody, a team around that's able to manage any of those complications. If you had to go in for, a, for an echo, this is what you could expect. You'd undress from the waist up. Um, the technician would attach a couple of uh, EKG electrodes to your body because they they uh, correspond the images with the EKG. They, uh, well, you'd be laying on a table. They put a little bit of gel on this transducer here, and that gives you good electrical or a good uh, conduction of the sound waves, rather. It's not electrical, it's just good conduction of the sound waves. And they just move this microphone back and forth to get different images. And sometimes you will hear a whooshing noise, and that's the sound of uh, blood flowing. This is kind of what they're looking at. Um, in this case, remember we talked about the pericardium and I said at times the pericardium can fill up with fluid and that can be abnormal. Well, this is your right ventricle. This is the aorta, the big blood vessel, the left ventricle. So those are the two main ventricles. This area, this is the heart in this area here. And this space outside the heart shouldn't be black, but it is because that's the pericardium filled with fluid. And that's how, how you can detect that with an echocardiogram. This is uh, another view of what, what an echo looks like. This is the corresponding image of the heart. So there's your left ventricle. Your mitral valve goes across here. The left atrium, that's that space there. The dark spaces are the chambers. The right atrium is right here. Here's the closed tricuspid valve. You can actually see these valves move on an echo through. And then there's the right ventricle. So that's the quality of image. It's kind of like reading clouds. But if you, if you look at them a lot, and, and I don't, but a cardiologist looking at these, they can tell you a lot about that just by glancing at it. Here's, here's what they look like in action. 
Uh, this would be your left ventricle. Up here is your left atrium. There's the uh, mitral valve. And then we've got this thing up here and that shouldn't be there. And that's a little tumor that's in the um, atrium. Um, this isn't the final, I think this is the final image I have for echoes, but this is what a heart murmur would look like on an echo. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't stop that loop. I don't know. Uh, but we'll just kind of look at that. Um, so if we have the left ventricle pumping through the aorta valve into the aorta, and if there's a leak, so in other words, when this valve closes, blood is still jetting back through a little opening, because maybe that valve is stiff, it's got calcium on it or something. They, they color code that. They can tell direction of flow by making them red or blue, the computers do these things. So here you can actually see the jet coming back through the aortic valve, um, and that's a, called aortic regurgitation. And that means you got a little bit of a leak there, and that would, that would create a sound that you could hear on exam. Um, that would be called a cardiac murmur. So a cardiolite, people who have had a nuclear stress test, this tells you even different information and, and really helpful information. This is um, the table that you would be on when it's being read. This is a detector. Uh, and this is what the images look like that the cardiologist would read. Um, this is a test that uses a small amount of a radioactive tracer and the imaging machine that I showed you to show the blood flow to various parts of the heart. So what's happening here is this tracer gets injected into the blood and as the um, blood is being circulated to the heart, the tracer is along with the blood. So it, it can indicate how much blood is, is actually being circulated to that part of the heart. Okay? If, you're, if you have a restriction, if you have an artery that's blocked, it may give you a good amount of blood at rest, but it cannot keep up with increased demand and you can see decreased flow then. And so in that case, you'll see less of that tracer will show up. So they do this test twice. They do it once when you're at rest and they repeat it after exercise to show areas of poor blood flow or areas of damage to the heart. Okay, because remember when our hearts are working faster, um, beating faster, increased workload, need more oxygen. Okay, you would, you would get this test to evaluate signs or symptoms that could be heart disease, like chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, you could establish a diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And you can also tell how well treatments are working or if previous stents are still working, that sort of thing. Risks, again, nothing is without risks. Nuclear stress tests are generally quite safe with complications being very rare. And this is usually, um, complications are usually associated with the stress portion of the test. Okay, and like before, if you get an arrhythmia, usually goes away after exercise is completed. Heart attack, exceedingly rare. Um, and low blood pressure, uncommon. Dizziness, uncommon. Uh, the big question everybody has that uh, you're wondering why I haven't put it up yet, of course, is what about that radioactive tracer? Um, that's not harmful. It's excreted from the body. The amount of radiation, they say, is equal to approximately three years of background radiation, which is what you get just walking around doing your activities of daily living, just walking around in the house, in the yard. That's radiation that comes from the sun. Um, if you live in Denver, it's equal to two years of radiation because people who live in Denver get more radiation because they're a mile closer to the, uh, to the sun, I guess, to where they have less atmosphere over them to filter out uh, or to block the radiation. So if you were to get a cardiolite, what would that be like? You put an IV in, they'll infuse some of that radio tracer. Some people say it feels cold when they, when they infuse it. Once that's had time to circulate around, they'll get those images while you're laying on a table. Um, and I'll just zip back quick to show you that table. Oh, I gotta go through all that. There it is. Um, that's the table you lay on and that's the sensor that's on top of it. Um, Okay, they'll put an EKG monitor on and then they'll exercise you either on a treadmill or a bike, or if you can't do that because you have a, maybe someone has a bad hip or a bad knee, um, they'll be given the IV medication, which simulates exercise. It just stimulates the heart to beat faster. And then they infuse the radio tracer again, get more images, 
and those are known as distress images. So the results, if you have normal blood flow during rest and during exercise, that's a normal test. If you have normal blood flow during rest, but not during exercise, meaning that you have decreased flow during exercise, that means the, the vessels can't keep up with the increased demand during exercise. So that means there's a narrowing or a blockage in an artery. That's normal during rest, but not during exercise. If you have limited flow both at rest and in exercise, it, may, it means that part of your heart's not getting quite enough blood all the time. So you either have fairly severe coronary artery disease and you might be getting chest pains even when you sit in a chair, uh, or you could have had a prior heart attack. And if there are areas of the, blood, of the heart that don't get any blood flow, that suggests prior heart attack because in a heart attack, um, heart muscle cells actually die and they're replaced with scar tissue. And when you replace them with scar tissue, blood doesn't flow through scar tissue. But it also doesn't conduct electricity. So that's why you get those EKG changes also. This is what results would look like. I don't read cardiolites, but I could tell you here's an example of normal and abnormal. So let's say this was a rest image and an exercise image. This would suggest that under stress, you're just not perfusing these areas of the heart. And this is just a cross section. And that would suggest problems with a, a blocked vessel. Here's another example. Uh, normal at rest, and that's that's coming down here. And then here, the um, apex doesn't have um, perfusion, doesn't have circulation to it, so that would be abnormal. So here's here's the final one that I wanted to talk about, and that's kind of the gold standard. This is the coronary angiogram, and I'll go through all the things that I went through on the other tests too. But I'll just say with this picture here, cardiologists who do this all the time know what to expect when they look at maps of vessels. Even though there are some variations between vessels, between people, there's so much similarity that they could glance at it and tell you, you know, in this picture, there's a whole vessel missing. And what the arrow is pointing at is that there's a blockage right here. And when you block this vessel, it can't fill, so there's no blood getting to it at all. This is one where they put a stent in here. They open it up, now blood flows, and you can see the whole area where that vessel extends that we couldn't see over here, okay? So that's what an angiogram can tell you. This is a procedure where they snake a catheter up, a tiny, tiny little catheter up into the coronary arteries, okay? They go right up by the heart and they go in that little opening that's above the aortic valve, the opening to the, the left main or the right coronary artery. And they inject a little bit of dye that's visible on X-ray machines and they can see outlines of the vessels, okay? It's a procedure they use for diagnosis, but also for treatment. So during a cath, they can find a blockage and frequently they can open that up, either with a little balloon or by putting a stent in and, and opening that blockage up. Why do we do them? Well, it's usually done after an abnormal stress test or in somebody with known coronary artery disease who's having a recurrence of symptoms or worsening of symptoms, chest pain, um, but commonly after an abnormal stress test, or in the setting of an acute MI. Um, time is so critical. And I, again, I'm not gonna get into MIs yet. I'm gonna leave some of that, leave that off for, for Jen. Um, time is critical. So if somebody gets a, an acute MI, in many cases, you wanna get them to the cath lab as quickly as you can. They also do these in the setting of a heart valve problem. If somebody needs to have a heart valve replaced, they'll usually do an angiogram to see what the state of the circulation is. And if they need to, to fix anything, they can uh, take care of that often at the same time. Risks, well, that's good. Heart attack, stroke, injury to catheterized artery, irregular heart rhythms. So when you're doing um, an angiogram, it's, it's an invasive test and these risks are present, but they're very, very minimal. And they're, they're particularly small when you weigh them against the benefits of the test, okay? And again, you're in a very controlled situation so that all these things can be addressed right away and frequently stopped right away. There is a little bit of radiation exposure from x-ray. So if you were to have an angiogram, what could you expect? Well, you'd be situated on, the, on an x-ray table okay, in the cath lab, specialized room. Um, you're wearing a hospital gown. They'll place an IV for sedation. Uh, although you don't need to be asleep and generally, uh, 
patients are awake for this. Uh, if a patient dozes off, they can be wakened easily. Common, they're in, commonly they're in conversation with the, with the cardiologist a little bit. Um, they'll put EKG leads on, they'll monitor blood pressure and pulse. And after a prep, um, they'll get vascular access. Now, most of the time now they go in through the right wrist. Uh, they used to go in more commonly through the groin, but they found this to be uh, easier. Um, you don't have to lay still for as long after, after a calf. So, so it prevents, uh, there's less bleeding. Uh, they, they numb up the area where they access the artery with lidocaine so you don't feel it. Um, it's pretty much like putting in an IV. Uh, they pass the catheter up through the artery to the heart. You don't feel this. X-ray camera locating over the table will uh, track that. You'll see it moving around from side to side periodically. And then they inject the dye so they can see the outline of the blood vessels. And sometimes people will feel a little bit of flushing or warmth associated with that. Um, the, the length of time of the procedure is very variable. It can take about an hour, sometimes they're less. If it's a complicated procedure, obviously, it could take quite a bit more. Uh, Squidge, do we have time to watch a video? It's 16 minutes. Okay, well, I think if we go past lunchtime, we'll probably lose people because they'll probably go to lunch. So we can hold it. And if you want, I can tack it on at the end. We can come back. I'll still be here. Okay. Yeah, maybe we'll try that at the end. If people that are still on, they want to watch the video. Okay. I'll just tell you that it, it shows a, uh, uh, a patient who's having an angiogram. You see the, the whole procedure from beginning to end. You get to see them do her, her prep, uh, passing catheters up. Nothing about it is gross. Um, and then you can see the images that they're looking at, and they talk to her. And the cardiologist actually will talk about what he's doing during different parts of the procedure. So I'll be uh, here and we can put this on later for people who okay. want to see. I know there was uh, one commenter. So I know yep. they said, how long does a stint last and do they wear out? Stents, um, stents can reocclude, but stents don't really have a life on them. Um, so they don't wear out, but what can happen is you can, uh, you can get blockages within stents. Sometimes they never block. Um, Sometimes they, you know, there's a risk that they can block within the first couple of weeks that they're in. So you, you watch for changes like that. I've uh, had patients who have had stents inside of stents, um, but in generally they, they don't have a, a, a life length to them. So there was another comment saying that you could, uh, if you want, you could send that link out for that YouTube video too as well. Yep, yep, and I have it here, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll absolutely do that. Okay, so we'll or if you up. post a video, yeah, if you post a video, then it'll be in there. Okay, so I know we'll open it up for Q and A. So I did have a couple of questions there, Doctor Dury. Yeah, so I know. What about like like your phone? You know, I know they say not to have your phone on uh, certain spots. You know, it's like if you have your heart on the phone on your heart, could that have an effect on it? Or also like a, uh, you know, when they resuscitate you and they give you the shock, do those mm -hmm. have um, effects on your heart? Okay, um, the, well, what the shock does is it kind of, usually you're shocking a rhythm where the heart is quivering, so the electricity is running all over the place in there. And when you do the shock, you're kind of clearing the deck and allowing that AV node to start doing, um, I'm sorry, the SA node to start generating its uh, pulse again. Okay, so um, the trade-off, of course, is if you don't shock, you, you tend to only shock rhythms that are potentially uh, bad news, you know. Sometimes you'll shock someone who's in atrial fibrillation. That's a lower, uh, a lower strength shock that doesn't damage the heart. Um, it can bump cardiac enzymes, um, but it doesn't cause heart damage. And that's to get someone back in a normal rhythm. The question about the phone, um, I am not aware of any uh, direct damage that can be done from radiation of the phone to the heart. Um, I think they're still gathering data on you know, people who are on their phone all the time, uh, and if, if that has any effect with, you know, neurological things or brain tumors and stuff, I don't think there's any hard data on that yet. Okay. Um, well, no, they, they say like those, uh, they send kind of certain whatever waves. Uh, I'm not sure if that was just a myth or not, but I'm probably um, around. Well, when you do the EKG on your, on your phone, you're actually, or on your watch, you're not holding it on your chest. Now, I don't know. I can't do it on my phone, but on my watch, I'm holding it here. And so 
there's a contact on the back of it that contacts my wrist, okay? So if I start it, um, I have to put my finger on the dial here. So what I've got is like an electrode from my right arm and one on my left arm. So it's just tracing the current. You can't see that probably, but. Oh you know. yeah, I can, that was that 2930. Yeah, but it's also giving me an EKG, like a red EKG line going across oh, like okay. that. Um, but that's just because it's taking, it's like if I had a lead here and a lead here. And so it does the current between those. So it's not like we have 12 leads and get all that information, but it can tell me uh, rhythm. And that's, yeah, there's no phone. It's just direct electrical signal that it's picking up. So it's not giving anything off. Okay. So I guess another question, say somebody comes in and sees you or Jen and they're under the influence of drugs and it's causing them to have an irregular heartbeat. Could that lead to a misdiagnosis or anything? Um, potentially, I mean, it tells you, you know, see someone's in atrial fibrillation or something like that. Um, I think we would evaluate it the same way. You want to make sure that it's, you know, a stable rhythm, perfusing rhythm. If they're, if they're not, if someone's, you know, passing out or if they're getting chest pain, we're going to, they're going to be going to the ER to get a full workup, but you can precipitate problems with drugs. Yes. Okay. And then my last question is like, so say I know we've uh, started to see more and more ODs, but so like Narcan, um, let's just say somebody ODs, they go out and you have to bring them back with mm -hmm. Narcan. Um, so I know like um, on Pulp Fiction, you know, they, they did the old, uh, where they had to do the adrenaline shot to the heart. So that's <laughs> on, uh, Vincent Vega, that, that Lance is showing Vincent Vega how to to give a adrenaline shot to the heart and they, they got that like that big needle that has yeah. to get to the breastplate. So now Narcan, you know, Narcan has obviously come a long way since then, but I was just wondering, um, uh, OD plus the adrenaline shot, does that have, does that cause your heart to maybe um, die a little bit or anything like that? Well, I, you know, I don't think they're doing adrenaline shots directly to the myocardium. Um, you know, epinephrine is used in, in ACLS for resuscitation of certain rhythms and so forth. Um, Jen could address that better if she knows, but I don't believe they're doing that. Um, Narcan itself is not going to cause damage to the heart muscle. Um, anything that causes the heart to go a period of time without oxygen, you know, if, if, if you go into cardiac arrest, there's going to be damage. You're going to lose some heart muscle because it needs that blood supply right um so there's damage from that um resuscitate we don't really think of resuscitation as contributing to the damage because you're trying to get the heart moving again so that it can pump blood to itself again you know what i mean so people that do od yeah i know they typically tell them that they once they come back from narcan that they should go to the hospital anyway uh, if people don't go back, you know, that that will probably have a lasting effect on their heart and might cause further problems down the road, correct? Well, the trouble is that Narcan only lasts for so long. Right. And so they'll go right back to where they were before. Okay. And if they're so sedated that they're not breathing, because that's usually the order of things. It's usually you stop breathing, your oxygen levels in your blood go down, your heart can only tolerate so much, and then it'll flip into an arrhythmia, right? So if you slip into that place again, that's the, that's the risk. Okay. So there's another question here. It says, so what about the heart flutters? Is that normal or can it be indication of a problem? Well, um, when people feel palpitations, like an extra beat here and there, most of the time that's completely harmless. If it's what's called a premature atrial contraction, you just, the heart gets a little jumpy. Sometimes caffeine will do that. Um, but if you're not sure, um, you can get it checked out because you can pick up, you know, rhythms on an EKG or if you're maybe if you're having symptoms, I should say if you're having symptoms with it, like I feel my heart kind of jumping around or going fast and I'm getting lightheaded, then we need to figure out what's going on there because you probably are slipping into an arrhythmia, possibly atrial fibrillation. Um, we have ways to pick that up, even if it's not happening while you're getting an EKG, because that's only a minute. You say, well, this only happens twice a day. There's ways that we can have you wear monitors for, you know, up to two weeks, you know, or 28 days. So we can, we can pick up things that are intermittent that way. Um, 
But if you just have the occasional, ooh, you feel that kind of extra beat or there's a pause and then you feel a hard beat, um, that can be okay. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to tell everybody right now that all the funny beats they feel are okay, but I can say that if you have premature atrial contractions, which are that, that occasional extra beat or early beat, followed by usually a little bit of a pause, that can be okay. But if you're getting a lot of them, probably should check it out. So there are a couple more comments here. So uh, another person says, so doing something is better than doing nothing when it comes to concerns about the heart, about damage to the heart. I feel people right. are so scared to do something, but there is the Good Samaritan lab. Um, oh, oh, are you talking about like resuscitating somebody who's down? I think that's like, they're like even shooting Narcan or whatever, you know? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if your intention is to, is to save someone, and usually you're in a situation where it's, you know, it's important. You know, it's not just, if somebody's sitting there talking to you and, and they're breathing okay, you know, unless they're complaining of chest pain or something, that means they're breathing and they're circulating. Okay. If they're unconscious, now you don't know. I, I mean, you're unconscious. Are they breathing? You want to check that, you know. If they're not breathing, that's a priority. Then you check the, you know, check pulse. I think it's a great idea for, for everybody to get certified in, you know, BLS or get a community BLS certification if they can, because you never know. Um, I think we're tracking back to when you're talking about your smartphone or smartwatch. Yeah. So there's a common saying, my phone is saying LT. I'm not sure if that was for you or maybe that might be for me. I'm not sure. Um, um, I, I'm not sure what that means. No, I, I'm just reading some of the chats here. Yeah. So I know there's one one that says, you know, you cannot help be liable for resuscitation efforts according to the Good Samaritan law. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. So is there any more questions for Dr. Dury? We'll give it a quick, quick another minute or so. Um, so that was a good presentation. I know you were pretty detailed and I got some good stuff out of there and uh, appreciate you taking your time and your willingness to do some community outreach and introduce yourself and get more familiar you know people see your face and like I said I know I'll see you up here early and I know I'll see you had no probably pretty much one of the last ones to leave so some long days and I appreciate you being there so any more questions for Dr. Dury? Well once okay so I know there was a, just someone thank you. Looking forward to reviewing on YouTube. I know there are some people that kind of came in the middle of some presentations. And this is our list will be on YouTube. So people are able to go back and review the whole thing on YouTube. So there's another one. It says months after having COVID, I find myself having, having a, I get a fast. A fast heartbeat. So can't you get a fast yep. heartbeat every now and then? Is that normal? Um, well, with COVID, they're finding now there are increased cardiac um, symptoms and, and things that can come up in the, in the year following COVID. And with long COVID, the, the jury is still out on what's going to go on with that. I would, I would look at that as you would whether or not you had COVID. So if you're noticing this a lot, if, especially if you have any symptoms with it, uh, or if it's going for a prolonged period of time, might want to get it checked out because um, it's hard. It's hard to say just with that little amount of information. But I would I would treat it not just oh I should expect that because I had COVID, but I would look at it as you would whether or not you had COVID. Okay. So there's your comment. It says uh, MIS. A a symptoms usually only manifest a few weeks after COVID. Is that uh, Paul? I think that was uh, Erica. So we'll, uh, I guess if there's no more questions. Okay, here's one. How is thyroid effects on the heart? I had too much RX a while back. It caused heart. Yep, palpitations. Um, so yes, thyroid and heart are. Uh, uh, says, uh, she had a, uh, they had a. EKG at the clinic, sent to the ER following stress, stress tests, et cetera. I am okay, but it's great 
to do a double check because both of her parents had heart disease. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right on that. Um, if you're hyper, usually if it's your thyroid is overfunctioning or if you're on too high of a dose, uh, you can get a fast heart rate, you can get palpitations, you can, you can feel your heart um, beating harder sometimes. Um, sometimes people on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes you'll see that they'll have a, a little bit of a slower heart rate. So thyroid does uh, play into that. I will say another thing, since palpitations came up a couple of times, usually once you've noticed that everybody gets them, everybody gets early beats here and there, but usually we're occupied with something else and we don't notice it. Once you notice it, you will tend to be more in tune with it and you will probably notice it more. Okay. All right, again, I thank you, Dr. Dury, for taking some time out of your busy day to provide us with some of your knowledge. I truly appreciate that and look forward to doing some more events with you down the road. So Thanks. thank you again. Without, uh, We'll go right on to our invited presenter. Our next presenter is Jen Kober, formerly Hawk. She's a nurse practitioner who works in cardiology in the Heart and Vascular Center from Essentia Health in Virginia. She'll be talking about heart failure. She has always showered the people at Boys Fort with her knowledge and her profession. She is committed to always providing her service and educating our community in heart health. Uh, Jen, we need more people like you to offer your help when asked. So with that, I say, Wopala. Hopefully I said that right, um, which means thank you in Sioux. So Jen Kober, whenever you turn your camera on, your presentation is up. Okay. Well, good morning. Thanks for that nice introduction, Squidge. <laughs> um, that was also a great presentation by Dr. Dury. He laid a nice uh, kind of segue in for what I'm going to talk about. I'm um, going to get right into the kind of pathologies or things that can go wrong with uh, your heart if you know, if we don't take care of it. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen here. All right. Trying to start the slideshow here. Hang on just a second. I'm not very techy. No, don't worry about it. It's all good. So, like I said, you know, I apologize. You know, we did have some technical difficulties. That's why we had a late start. So, now we're a little bit behind schedule, but for the most part, everybody was pretty good about. Uh, keeping their presentations within the time frame. Uh, we will be doing some prizes after Jen's presentation or maybe before Dr. Dury's video, if we have time. Like I said, we're just waiting for Jen to share her screen. <laughs> okay, are you able to see that or no? <laughs> Not yet. You did have it up before. Oh, I did. Okay. I did have it up before. I just couldn't figure out how to. Yes, there we go. The slide. Yeah. So it there is. now. Can you see it? Yes. Now we are. Oh, up okay. It's nice. Got to figure out how to. Uh, there you go. No. Just about figuring out how to switch to your. On the left, click from the beginning. On the left. Ah, yeah. thank you. There we go. <laughs> okay, like Squidge said, I'm Jennifer Colbert. We're with Essentia Health here in uh, Virginia. I am primarily uh, only in Virginia, and I see a uh, general variety of cardiology. I know there was a lot of questions earlier about palpitations and fluttering arrhythmias. We see quite a bit of that. Um, like Dr. Dury mentioned that we do, if someone's coming in and they're recognizing skip beats or and primarily they feel it at night when they're laying quietly because they don't, 
they're busy in their day, they don't recognize it if they're doing their daily activities. But uh, always feel free to get that checked out. Um, and, you know, we can do monitors or an EKG as mentioned before. Okay, so I'm going to just jump right into coronary artery disease. So here's a, a picture of the heart and um, it shows like a blood clot or you can see the layers of the inflammation a lot uh, like what I saw Dr. Dory talked about in the normal heart. This is when um, this is a picture of when you start having plaque buildup or inflammation in those different linings of the vessel. Usually when this starts here, then that's when it can cause a heart attack. There are three major vessels here. This is over here. Are you able to see my, my uh, arrow? Yeah. Yep. I'm okay, good. Yeah, yeah. All right. So there's three major vessels. There's one, there's this left anterior descending. This is the main one. I know I have a lot of patients say, oh, is this the widow, widow maker? This is a main one that provides the biggest blood flow to this left ventricle. This left ventricle is our powerhouse kind of muscle that pushes the blood out through the aorta into the body full of oxygenated blood. As you can see, if anywhere along these vessels get blocked, the area below it, the cells aren't getting good nutrition or blood flow and they will start to die. When this happens, that's when you will generally start getting symptoms. A lot of times, um, people will recognize it when they are exerting themselves more than normal. When people are wondering, oh, am I having a heart attack? Am I, or is this, you know, indigestion, you know, any kind of symptoms that where they get worried that they're having some chest pain, even kind of stress and anxiety can bring on some of these symptoms. A lot of times I will question them. Is it coming on just when you're sitting, when you're sitting at night watching TV, or is it when you get up, you're carrying groceries, it comes on, you sit down, you rest, it goes away that's more suspicious if it's triggered by exertion. Uh, some people though, you know, if they are stressed, it puts a little more, uh, you know, um, getting a little anxious, it will put a little bit more stress on that muscle and that can trigger the same symptoms. So I just added this in right before the talk because um, I'm kind of talking about what can go wrong. Well, here is, so this is kind of a snapshot of what, when say someone comes and sees me after they've had an angiogram, which uh, Dr. Dory was explaining. So this is a nice picture that we get and it's good to, for me to explain to patients so they can see. So here's like, for example, now this is a, this is a picture of a pretty diseased heart. So this is your left anterior descending. This is a main vessel I was telling you about that's providing blood flow to that left ventricle. Okay, this is a circumflex. Now, normally in a normal heart, you know, this vessel here wraps around the backside. These are all the off branches. And then this is your right coronary artery that comes around the right side of the heart here. So this shaded area here is when the cardiologists are doing the angiograms, this shaded area here is representative of blockage. So for example, this patient here, he has 100% blockage. This here is um, the left main too. This is a major, major one. You lose this one, this is generally not gonna end well. So we try to always protect this, this kind of line of circulation here. So this guy here has 100% blockage here. He also has 99% blockage here on the right. Hunter down here. And then it kind of, this is representative too that there's no real blood flow out to these small branches. And all these branches are very important. Even if you just get a blockage in one of these smaller branches that can still cause damage or symptoms. These here, I um, like to show, is it a, a representation of bypasses? So I think sometimes when people hear, oh, you know, a patient got, you know, a family member, their dad or their grandpa got a bypass. Um, this is kind of what they look like. So this one here is a, you know, of what we call a left internal mammary artery. So this is coming off one of the arteries in our chest that is directly connected, kind of bypassing this, this blockage here, and now is providing good blood flow all the way down here. Same thing over here. There's a right internal mammary artery, again, connected right to our chest. So our own arterial, arterial circulation bypassing this again. 
this guy here, when he came in this time, he was, there was blockage here. So he was having pain. So they went through this bypass and into this and placed a stent here. He's a, this is always represented. I, oops. Oh, shoot. How do I go back? Do you know how to go back, Squidge? Oh, I'm not good at chairing either. Oh, dang. Hey, Becca, are you guys on? The previous on that menu that popped up. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this here too is like, uh, so the stanting that we can put in, but also then if you see this purple line here, this shows what we call collateral flow. So when there is a lot of blockage in the heart in these major vessels, over time, your heart will start to develop small little vessels providing blood flow to the other side. So this patient here, he started growing blood vessels down to provide to the end of these two. So we will grow our own flow and try, I mean, the heart's, I think it's miraculous, but it does start kind of protecting itself by growing blood flow. If one area is not getting enough, it'll grow smaller vessels from the other, from the, you know, the other vessel across the way to try to help protect the, the, the cells and the tissue. So anyways, I thought this was kind of neat. And I just wanted to add in there to explain exactly, you know, how, where stents are placed, we can put them in all these uh, um, smaller vessels. So. Okay. So symptoms. Um, these are, you know, I know a lot of people have heard kind of the classic um, sub, you know, when they say substernal, that's like right in the middle of your chest. And that is the classic kind of uh, sign of chest pain, but doesn't always happen. You know, um, some men seem like they more commonly get that classic symptom of that chest pain or the pain down the arm into the jaw. Some symptoms are even just if your left hand or arm is numb and tingling. And even just like say, again, you know, you're shoveling snow and just your, your arm starts tingling or, or going a little uh, numb. That could just be a symptom of it too. And shortness of breath, of course, is very classic. And that generally comes on again with exertion. Women can be a little different in that uh, you know, they may just feel like they're getting the flu or, uh, you know, not, not feeling good, tired. Uh, um, I've also had some of my, uh, older women who have say arthritis and they, they blame it on, oh, it's my arthritis acting up and think that that's generally what's causing them to slow down a little bit more, or people feel like, oh, I'm just getting older. I just can't, I get shorter breath quicker, but all those that you notice a change, say in a short period of time. Um, you know, say like, if you can't do what you could do six months ago, that's a fairly short span. Then that's generally like when we would like, when we see our patients annually, I always try to ask, well, have you noticed a change over the past few months versus, well, I, you know, it's the same as I've been the last you know, couple of years. So that's how we kind of gauge uh, if there's been some progression or if you're having new set, new symptoms. So risk factors, I know we have gone over this um, today a little bit, but also every year with this uh, conference, uh, smoking is a huge one. Um, I'm gonna touch base on each of these a little bit, but smoking, of course, being overweight, diabetes, uh, and that's a huge risk factor, a lot due to um, the general inflammation that it causes on our vasculature. Anytime there's inflammation, everything gets a little more sticky. Uh, poor diet, you know, sticking with more lean meats and high fiber is much better. And staying active, I can't say enough about make sure uh, you're staying active, increasing your heart rate. Um, that just really helps with uh, keeping off diabetes as well as heart disease. Cholesterol, we're going to talk a bit about this and blood pressure control. So this is, I just added this and this is a cardiovascular risk assessment. Uh, you can look this up, Google it. I tried to figure out how to put it on here so we could do it together, but I of course couldn't figure it out how to put that on there. Um, but this is great. Now this is to do if you have no prior or no known history. So if you're, you know, have never been told you have heart disease, I don't know you have heart disease. And it's most accurate for those ages, uh, 40 to 79 years of age. And that just gives you a general percentage of what your uh, risk is in a 10 year span to have a, a heart attack or an event. 
um, you need to know usually your cholesterol numbers, uh, your age, and um, most recent blood pressure. But this is something that, like I said, if you look it up, anyone can do it. And it's, it's one thing that we usually try to put in uh, when we see younger people or those who have no prior cardiovascular history. Prevention, um, again, this is you know what I just kind of touched on, the tobacco elimination that, like I said, the chronic nicotine causes uh, inflammation as well, uh, cholesterol lowering, blood pressure. Here we talk about staying physically active at least more than 150 minutes a week of uh, moderate or greater than 75 minutes of vigorous activity. Aspirin, this has been a kind of hot topic this last year, started getting a lot of questions and phone calls from patients about, well, should I be on aspirin? You know, when it came out in the news about, it's not necessarily recommended just for anybody to take it. Uh, but of course, for my patient population, Yes. I mean, if you have any risk factors, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and even those, you know, people who have a strong family history and smoke, I think it's still beneficial in that situation. Um, the type two by uh, diabetes control, a diet and exercise, uh, the newest medications here with those SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP1 um, antagonists, those are kind of our uh, newest medicines that we're even starting to use in cardiology. Uh, I'm gonna talk about those a little bit later. And then of course, metformin is the initial therapy. Again, smoking, uh, can't say it enough about the importance of quitting smoking. If you have coronary disease and you're smoking, if we go in there and put a stent in, I know somebody asked, I, um, I think Pam asked about how long stents last. If you're a smoker, they don't last as long as if you quit. If you continue to smoke, we almost always see people back and need to uh, actually layer stents. We can put them inside of another one to try to keep that open. So it does, uh, smoke increases the formation of plaque in blood vessels. It can cause the blood to thicken, which then of course contributes to clotting inside the veins and the arteries. And nicotine itself increases blood pressure, heart rate, and then the narrowing. And um, I mean, this is, this is a little older, but it may, it may be, it's, I'm sure it's about the same that it accounts for 33% of all deaths from cardiovascular disease. So here's the cholesterol numbers. Um, this one here, it talks about being good, less than a hundred. That, uh, that's generally like what we would push for uh, if you don't have any known risk factors. Like if you have coronary disease, if you have diabetes, we really like to push that less than 70. Um, and I'm primarily talking about LDL because this is the one that we treat. We, you know, the total, a lot of people want to know their total, but generally, you know, we're, this is our number to treat anymore. We used to really focus on increasing HDL, which a, a high HDL is excellent. And this is usually representative of someone who's a little bit more active or has like a, eats a high um, fiber diet, more of the Mediterranean type diet. Um, but truly, we, we really focus on the LDL numbers. Triglycerides, I see these fluctuate a lot with um, if someone's, you know, of course, their diet is heavy in more saturated fats. I see in people who drink alcohol um, excessively, their triglycerides run high. Uh, higher blood sugars will also push those a little bit high. So that's more reflective of dietary um, and still just as important. But when you get a panel, you can really explain, um, you know, if we need to, need to focus a little bit more on um, diet or blood sugar control or decreasing alcohol intake. So patients with uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, smoking, or strong family history, we really try to focus on reducing their LDL um, with the high intensity statins. Um, high intensity statins typically is like the Crestors and the Torvastatin. Uh, usually we start off generally at 40. If someone's coming out of the hospital, been fresh stent, they usually get discharged on a high a Torvastatin 80. Um, and then we, I, typically adjust those medicines based on their LDLs, LDL is after about three months of therapy. I still love Zetia on here because that has kind of 
was in favor, fell out of favor. Now we're starting to use it a little bit more. Um, again, if we need additional help to get those numbers to goal, uh, primarily, I mean, it could just come down to that. We know that if you got a lower LDL, that your risk overall is, is you know, is better of getting as far as getting cardiovascular disease. So, and the Zetia we know works and it's fairly well tolerated. Our newest uh, medications on the block in which I have been using quite a bit is this PCSK9 inhibitors. The brand names are Rapatha or Proluent. These are injectable medications and they're like a subcutaneous injection. So like an insulin um, type needle and it's, it comes in pen form or either you can get pre-filled syringes and they come to your home. Once in a while, I have patients who don't like to give themselves shots will come in and nurses will help them uh, you know, do it for first few injections, and then they get pretty comfortable with it. We see excellent results with this. I have um, initially, these came out as kind of, um, actually, I think the FDA came out where they're to use in addition to statins. But I, I think most of us commonly are using it for those who feel they are intolerant to statins. So they just feel like they can't handle the higher doses or we can only get them on, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a torvastatin. Um, for example, I, the, the picture of that uh, angiogram I showed you is actually of one of my patients and he couldn't tolerate statins and he was only on like a torva 10. And uh, I think his LDL was 121 and I added Rapatha and within eight weeks, his LDL dropped down to 16 and we actually, you know, were able to kind of decrease his use of the Atorva then, Atorva statin so that he, um, to help some of his muscle aching. So I did talk, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the side effects because of statins. Now, the reason I'm not bringing these up to discourage people from using it, but I just kind of wanted to put out that, that statins got kind of a bad rap. And I can tell you that I spend half my day sometimes just talk, trying to convince people of the importance of them. I feel like they're so effective that it should be in the water. Um, but it does this, I put in here the very rare muscle damage that people hear about this rhabdomyolysis. I've, I've only seen it once in my 16 years in cardiology, where it's actually true uh, muscle breakdown and, and trouble from that we could actually link it to the statins. Um, there's also been talk about the raising of the blood sugar from these. Now, it's not going to cause you to develop type 2 B diabetes per se. I think if this occurs, you've probably already um, at a higher risk of uh, developing it. Um, and generally, if you're to the point where we need to have you on statin medications, the benefit outweighs the risk. So I just wanted to touch a little bit about that because I also did, um, when I was kind of researching some of the, the, I was trying to get some specific numbers on the side effects of statins. I've come across this uh, study through the Mayo Clinic that talked about that, you know, with the most common complaint being of muscle aching, if researchers found that there was something called a noxebo effect where patients, their perceived negative effect from the medication. So like, you know, they heard their, their, you know, uncle got muscle aches or, you know, they just hear that statins are terrible, that a lot of times that was already in their mind that they were going to develop it. And they found like 30% of the people who stopped their medicine were on a placebo, there was no medicine, there was no statin in it. So I just like to bring that up that even if there is if you feel like you're getting muscle aching from your statin, um, you know, there's different things that we can do to uh, fix that, which I'll touch on a moment. But here's people that do develop some side effects are some smaller frame, bo um, body framed women um, being female. If you're on multiple, so this generally came with some of our, I didn't have it on the list of the other meds, but like some, what we call phenofibrates are some triglyceride lowering medications. Uh, when com combined with our stands, we've seen a little higher uh, intolerance. If you all have kidney failure or liver failure, you're going to be at a greater risk. Alcohol intake, again, because both these medicate the statins and alcohol are metabolized and broke down through uh, similar pathways in the liver. 
and then hypothyroidism, other neuromuscular disorders. So if you already have, um, you know, something underlying, it can add to that. What we do, if someone, you know, we'll try our best to keep people on these statins, if we can, we can have them take a brief break from satin therapy, a holiday, uh, some people have called it. And that's where we have them hold their cholesterol medicine for a good, say, two to four weeks. Generally, if you're getting side effects from your cholesterol medicine, you'll, it, it'll start to improve within a week or two once you hold it. Once we get off of it and you're getting better, I will try again, like a different kind. Like if you're on a Torval, I'll try a little bit of Crestor, but even just doing like five milligrams, three times a week helps, you know, just a little bit is better than nothing to help um, protect those vessels. There was um, one thing I wanted to talk about too, about how uh, statins help is to reduce inflammation. It's not just targeting the LDL or the plaque. But inflammation, I know I keep bringing up inflammation because we're finding it's very key. And how to explain it best is like, say if you have a, a rash on your, on your skin, the immune system or wound, the immune system recognizes this and uh, you know, sends out these immune response or these enzymes. And when it goes, it's the same idea as how the immune system rep, kind of recognizes when you get plaque in the vessel. It's recognizes it's not supposed to be there. So it actually creates more inflammation around where that area of the plaque is. And then the immune system kind of attacks, it sends out these enzymes they are actually enzymes that we can measure, but it then changes that waxy plaque into more like a liquid substance. And then when that leaks back into the bloodstream, that triggers increased clotting and then can cause heart attacks. So it's kind of like this chain event. Um, so again, um, that's why we feel that controlling the inflammation is so important. Uh, a little bit about those injectables. I know a lot of my patients are like, well, how do they work? And basically, you know, they work to, there's, there's little receptors on the liver that uh, can get broke down. And those receptors on the liver actually help kind of collect the LDL or the bad cholesterol and then get rid of it. And so these, these inhibitors block those, um, that dis, the destruction of those receptors on the liver. But again, like I mentioned, it has reduced, I've, it's been, those injectables have been shown to reduce the LDL by at least 50%, half cut them, at least cutting them in half for sure. I've seen that. Okay, blood pressure. Here's some normal ranges of blood pressure versus, um, when we start looking at treating it. I know here at Essentia, there's all kinds of, um, you know, goals or parameters we get to meet overall, and they're constantly monitoring if we're treating people's blood pressure appropriately, uh, because it is, blood pressure is something that is, can be a very silent uh, underlying symptom of cardiovascular disease. And so if we can capture it uh, when you come in and treat it, rather than just say, oh, well, you're borderline, you're borderline and keep leaving it. Cause it truly is. They do recommend like after one or two times, if you're still elevated that we should treat it. And it really has been shown to help decrease, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, organ damage. So goal is about the 120 or 120 over 70 or less is truly what we try to push people to. Um, but in general, uh, my elderly patient, for sure, I like to at least keep them under the 140 over 90. I just put a little plug in. This is um, about the diabetes and the importance of uh, controlling that with, um, you know, keeping your wrist down for overall microvascular complications, the very small vessels and the eyes and the kidneys and uh, peripheral, like in your hands and feet. I thought this was kind of funny. This is a lot, family history is very strong, but also again, we really encourage uh, you to stay active. Um, I, again, about the aspirin, kind of what I've already mentioned, if you have any questions, just ask your um, family provider. 
or medical practitioner if, um, if you think that you should be on aspirin, or you could do that calculated risk factor and see if your 10 year risk is greater than 10%, then it would be um, starting a baby aspirin is a good, a good plan. Okay, I'm gonna jump into heart failure. Uh, so heart failure is a complex syndrome that can result from the structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or the ejection of blood. So I did see when Dr. Dury was starting, he talked about the overall normal uh, circulation of blood through the heart. And again, when we talk about heart failure, we're primarily talking about this left ventricle here. So normal ejection fraction out of here is 55 to 60%. And that's with each contraction or each beat of your heart. Um, this over here is the right ventricle. As mentioned before, this side is receiving the blood from your from your body. This is all venous over here. So this doesn't have any oxygen or not much that's been utilized by your body. So the veins push the blood back to the heart here on this right side. And then this right side pushes the blood through your pulmonary arteries and then it goes through the lungs and then it comes back into the left side now from your pulmonary veins full of oxygen and ready to be ejected out of the heart um, to the body, to all your vital organs. So that's kind of the, the normal cycle. So there's two kinds of heart failure. There's a one uh, where the muscle is weak and the, that left ventricle becomes kind of enlarged or dilated as we, we call it. And it's where it can't pump enough blood uh, when that ventricle contracts. And the ejection fraction, uh, usually when we start calling it systolic is anytime it's less than uh, 45 or 50%. Diastolic heart failure, that's when the muscle becomes a little bit stiff and does not relax normally in between contractions. And so it doesn't fill adequately. Again here, less than, already talked about that, less than 40%. Symptoms, um, when it's, Oh, it's abnormal day. So it's going to turn. Oh yeah. That's the stuff that doctor, or these are the testing that Dr. Dury already talked about the echo. The echocardiogram is our gold standard for diagnosing those. I have, um, where like if we've done cardiolite stress tests on people again, where were they talk about that radio, um, tracer, uh, uptake of that tracer when you're doing stress testing that sometimes can give us very abnormal readings. I've gotten where I've sent someone for a stress test, came back, showed that their ejection fraction was 35%. Um, and then we, we did an echo just to verify that. And, and it was, you know, the echocardiogram, which is our gold standard and most accurate was it showed that the heart function was normal. So if we're truly going to diagnose heart failure, we use it by echo. So this is what we call cardiomyopathy cardiomyopathies, that's basically, you know, where the heart muscle is not functioning normally. So this is a normal, it's kind of a smaller picture, but this is a normal sized heart. When it starts to get big and baggy here, it's called dilated and the muscle gets weak. Then even this, this mitral valve here on this left side can start to get loose too, because this is, you can see, this is getting bigger. Normally valves nice to be, you know, nice and tight, they close tight, they open wide. When this gets dilated, then the, the valves even become affected. So now you got, not only is this not squeezing as strong, the left ventricle's not squeezing as strong, but now you're getting also this leaky valve. So you kind of got a weak muscle and then you're getting this backflow back up and going towards the lungs. And then that's when, again, can contribute to, if you hear people getting fluid in their lungs or when they get short of breath, because the, the blood's going, you know, it's not moving forward as well. Here, uh, something called hypertrophic, and that's basically where the thickening of this muscle, you know, the ventricle is a muscle and anytime it's got to work real hard, like against high blood pressure, you know, against these stiff vessels, um, or in uh, pulmonary disease, we see this a lot too, or sometimes people just have a genetic predisposition to it and get this thickening. So you can kind of see like normal, okay, this is a normal 
and then look at this where it gets thickened. This cavity here, or you know, the, the space to put the blood in is less. So it becomes a difference of like, okay, you're gonna fill a balloon full of water and you can put blood in there and there's a little bit more give versus now we're gonna fill a cup. And if you get excess volume in that, it's just gonna spill over quickly. There's no, you know, there's not as much um, reserve you know, when it's got this thickened muscle that just doesn't relax as well. This, I heard everyone kind of talking about this. I added this um, slide in just last week because this is something we are seeing a rise in is uh, heart failure from the, what we call toxic cardiomyopathies. This is from the methamphetamines. Uh, you know, meth is a stimulant and it causes uh, the vessels in our heart and our lungs to constrict and spasm. And that repeated kind of insult on um, the muscle and the cells, it can cause arrhythmia. So it can kind of create this rewiring of the heart's electrical system and causes an uneven heartbeat, which then of course can, you know, lead to a heart attack or a stroke. It also changes the structure of the heart muscle, making it less able to pump the blood. That's kind of where it's talking about the um, heart failure. And again, it causes chronic inflammation. Anytime you're putting a toxin in your body, like nicotine, or I mean, even chemotherapy, you know, it does cause a chronic uh, inflammatory response. Jen, sorry to cut you off. I know mm -hmm. one person has their hand up. Oh, okay. I can't and see that. No, that's right. Amber is upon if you just want to type in your, your chat or your question. You should be able to use the chat box there, Amber. Sorry about that. Oh, she said sorry, she didn't know her hand was raised. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I, uh, I, I get it. <laughs> um, then also alcohol. Uh, alcohol is a big one too uh, that we have been seeing. And uh, sometimes it's not overly obvious when it's alcohol induced. You know, sometimes when I'm following in them in the heart failure program, we, we, as we talk longer, we find that, okay, they have been drinking, you know, well, maybe they don't consider heavy drinking, but uh, I did write down here when I looked up the actual recommendations, anytime you, it occurs in the setting of having drinking, which for men is more than four drinks in a day or 14 in a week, or for women, three drinks in a day is seven in a week. And so that's like, if it's, you know, continuous, if you're doing that, you know, week on, you know, for a long term that can, the, the alcohol is also, is very toxic to that muscle. I generally, I mean, we can see it where it causes um, some of the weakening of the muscle, but also I see where it's a big contributor to um, the diastolic, the thickening as well. So symptoms of heart failure. Sometimes these can be very similar to having a heart attack. You know, you get the shortness of breath, feel the heaviness in the chest, but there'll also be some signs that you're just full of fluid. And so you may notice a sudden weight gain, um, particularly like overnight, I mean, say, say you go out to dinner and you have some barbecue ribs or pizza, something that's very salty. And, you know, you have several drinks that all can, if you're, if your muscle isn't working as well as it should, it won't cycle, won't move forward. And so you will feel you can gain up to three to four pounds overnight. Um, and so I, to watch for that for sudden gains, not just kind of a gradual, a cough, especially at night when you lay down. So you go to lay down and you got to kind of sit up uh, to catch your breath or to clear or feel like you got this tickle in the back of your throat. Uh, increased shortness of breath activity. That's a big one. Abdominal bloating. So you just feel very bloated in the tummy or you feel full after eating small amounts. May, like you may feel hungry. You go to start eating and you feel full right away or even just drinking water. I have some of my patients when we're kind of triaging them over the phone, like, well, they'll say, oh, I just, even when I drink water, I feel full. And they can eventually even start vomiting fluid if, if they just get so full of it. Uh, lower leg swelling, you will notice a decrease in urine output just because everything is congested and full, even your kidneys can get congested and not 
which then affects their filtering uh, ability and making urine. And then you're just plain wore out and tired. So we do have a question in the chat. It says, does autoimmune disease contribute to heart disease or do damage to arteries and or valves? Yeah, you know, that was actually something I was going to add on. I thought about even putting it on a risk factor. Uh, we know that rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, psoriasis, any autoimmune disease that is causing kind of your immune system to turn on itself or create uh, your a chronic state of inflammation can contribute to, to the um, to vascular disease. So yes, I mean, that's, we've had where that's been like someone's only risk fact or only, you know, when they and they come in, primarily, I see that a little more in, in women with the autoimmune causing it. So then some, this I kind of added in just to this is what we look for. If you go in and see your, um, your provider and you are, you know, looking at symptoms or they're looking at symptoms of kind of figuring out what's wrong. And again, kind of a went through the, the belly bloating, shortness of breath. Um, I got right heart failure and left heart failure because they are two very different things. Um, progressive left heart failure can eventually cause right heart failure, but some people just have trouble with failure on the right side of the heart. Again, that's where I was talking about where it's more of your venous system, the, the veins. And so if it's occurring on the right side, it's going to back up. And that's when we see more of the leg swelling, the abdominal bloating, but then say your lungs are clear. So that's all right-sided failure. If, if it's more left side, if you can remember the blood is coming from your pulmonary veins uh, or your lungs into the heart on that left side, and it can't keep up the first place it's going to back up is to your lungs. And so you will be more congested, shorter breath. If you hear, hear of the, um, of, you know, if you've had fluid on the lungs, some of people call it, um, or I've heard some people describe it as fluid around the heart, but truly what it is, it's where it starts to build up in uh, the thoracic, in your cavity, uh, your chest cavity between the lungs and your, uh, your chest wall. So there's just some of the things that we look at um, on exam. We may look at your, your this is a, what we call JVD or jugular vein distension. This is actually our kind of number one thing I look for if somebody is really full of fluid, because this, again, this is your venous system. When you lie back, if that vein in your neck is more distended or sticking out, or sometimes I can see if people are just sitting upright in a chair, that's a sign that they got additional, that your vascular system is just full. You can get a third, uh, like a third heartbeat. And that's again, because of just how they, the heart is beating and it's full of fluid. Um, and lots of, uh, like again, gastrointestinal feeling bloated. Um, some lipid, uh, laboratory data, again, this, these are things that mainly like we would check. I know someone mentioned thyroid hormone. Yes, I do see that the thyroid really, if that's off, especially with rhythm, it, it can be um, kind of a long process because we got to wait for that thyroid to get stable, like, especially if it's in relation to atrial fibrillation. Um, it's kind of pointless to get aggressive and treat the atrial fibrillation if your thyroid is still off. So it does, we do take a while. Um, but as long as you're protected with a blood thinner and your heart rate's controlled, um, atrial fibrillation isn't going to harm you as long as it's well managed. And we keep a very close eye on the kidneys and, um, electrolytes with heart failure. Um, cause a lot of times people are on the diuretics, the water pills. I'm not going to talk too much about this because Dr. Doherty talked about the diagnostic tools. Again, main thing is like, if you feel, if you think you're having any heart failure symptoms, we do an echo. If you think that you're having chest pain or coronary disease, we do stress testing. So when we're trying to figure out what, why someone's in, you know, heart failure or developing symptoms, we always got to figure out the underlying cause. Um, so atrial fibrillation, again, to bring that up, uh, because it is pretty common, 
if someone's in it and it's a it's kind of an irregular chaotic rhythm it's where your own little pacemaker your own essay node isn't controlling or driving the ship anymore the atria is just on top just fibrillating and uh, beating really fast and if it sends signals down to the ventricle and it's following that muscle can get wore out like if it's just beating too fast almost always though once we correct that slow the heart rate down uh, allow that heart muscle to rest and recover almost always see uh, regain you know return to normal function uh, hypertension over time uh, can cause that thickening of that muscle. Again, uh, you know, just working really hard against these stiffened vessels can create that muscle to get thicker. Ischemia, that's again, more like, um, again, ischemia is like if you're having blockage is what that means. Um, and it's causing ischemia is when you're actually having damage to uh, starting to be symptomatic and having damage to that heart muscle. I'm just gonna to touch a bit here on medications because I, these are these medicines that we use to treat heart failure are also very common medications for blood pressure. So when we're talking, these are medications to treat low heart function, okay? There's a, a little recipe, the specific meds that we need to use anytime someone's heart function drops below 45%. These are the um, guideline medicines that we use, uh, bisoprolol, metoprolol, or carvedilol. These are all beta blockers. And these protect the heart from those uh, adrenaline type chemicals we put out, like in a fight and flight response. If you get really stressed or under a lot of grief and you're feeling um, you know, really stressed for a long time, that those kind of chemicals we put out in our body can be hard on that heart muscle and actually can cause it to be weakened. But also then it causes the heart rate to go up, the blood pressure to go up. And so the, the beta blockers help kind of protect your heart muscle from the response of that. ACE inhibitors are angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, lisinopril, enalapril, osartan, valsartan. Um, that whole line of medicines are very important in treating heart failure. Those help kind of dilate the vessels and uh, so that the heart doesn't have to squeeze the blood into like this constricted vascular bed. It also works um, on a hormonal level. A lot of what goes on in the body in like this big snowball effect in heart failure is hormonal. Um, and so I just like to mention this because my heart failure patients, I'll put them on these medicines, but then as soon as like, if they go in and their blood pressure is a little low, they think they can stop them because they think they're on the medicines for blood pressure. So I always tell people, no, these are, this is your therapy and we keep it on as long as in as high as dose as you can tolerate and as long as it's actually indefinite um, once you've been diagnosed with heart failure. Aldosterone antagonist, this is like your spironolactone or your plirinone. This, uh, we add that one. If you were to look it up, just look up those medicines. They are under diuretics or water, you know, like diuretics or water pills. But these two medicines are very important in, in um, helping so that heart muscle doesn't change shape. It actually keeps your kidneys from retaining more sodium and water um, and helps with potassium maintenance too, if you have to be like on a Lasix or one of the other diuretics. Uh, so those are, um, those top three are the main ones that we try to get on board. Uh, we got some newer medicines that I'm just going to touch base on here in a second. If you have kidney disease and you cannot tolerate, and I should say advanced kidney disease. So anytime your creatinine is greater than 2.0 or 2.5, um, we, we try to stay away from the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or aldosterones, antagonists, and then we can use more like a hydrolyzine or a long acting uh, nitroglycerin and those provide the same benefit. Here is a list of our most common diuretics we use, furosemide, normally called Lasix, or commonly, I should say, torsemide, bumix, and I added this one here, metolazone. I call this my power pill. I will use this one in addition to their maintenance. I don't ever put anyone on this daily. Uh, it causes significant uh, excretion of their electrolytes, and then causes, and we end up kind of trying to keep up with that. Um, but so I will add this on if our patients were monitoring on a scale or they're having a decompensated episode, the metol metolazone really helps with giving them a boost. And I've seen people lose like eight pounds overnight uh, with eight to 10 pounds overnight with that metolazone. So they don't leave the bathroom much, but it works very well. Um, and then digoxin, which this is an old med. We don't use it as much in heart failure. I primarily use this now in control of heart rate and atrial fibrillation. Um, but this used to be kind of an older med we used. 
the newest medicines out there is called in, it's Entresto. You may have seen the commercial of they're singing the sun will come out tomorrow or it, it this is one of the I shouldn't say well it is newer but it's been on the market now gosh I think for five six years at least and I would probably try to get everybody on this if I could it's just we have a lot of trouble with coverage of course uh, insurance coverage because it is a newer medicine and it is um it's getting better with its coverage, but so we do use some compassionate care or, or things like that if we need to get them on it. Generally, if we have someone on like the beta blockers, and then I try to have them on the lisinopril, and say so we got them on the highest dose of lisinopril, and we, we do another echo, and their heart function hasn't gained any ground, or um, they're having more symptoms, we will push to try to get them on this entresto. This entresto is actually a combination of Valsartan, which is like what I just talked about, one of those ARBs, and then a newest one called a succubitril, which actually helps increase um, uh, urination. And so a lot of times when we start this entresto, we can actually back off on their uh, water pills too. And it's just been, I, I have one patient that we were needing to send her for routine, uh, what we call um, paracentesis. She would build up so much fluid on her belly and we'd have to send her in about every two to three months to get that fluid pulled off. And I put her on Entresto. And since we put her on there, we have not had to uh, send her in for that kind of procedure or remove fluid from her belly since. So she's, uh, she's very happy. So it's working great. Here's one of these newer medicines I was talking about earlier, these SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, being, I know that the primary providers probably know a little bit more than I do, because it's just kind of up and coming with us using it a lot in cardiology. I've been putting a lot of my heart failure patients on um, like either the Farsiga or the Jardians and like I said, I'm just kind of starting to use it. So I haven't seen uh, significant changes yet, but I am very excited to see the um, clinical benefits from, from it again. With that, with those newer medicines, it does make you pass more glucose out into the urine. So it does increase urination. And, um, and so I, you know, it also helps with the fluid and we have been able to back off and some of the water pills with that as well biggest side effect from those uh, medicines is watch for yeast infections. If you have two or more infections, then it is recommended to, to discontinue that medication. And it's also those medicines, which is exciting. It's been shown to, to show benefit with this preserved ejection fraction. So that diastolic heart failure, that kind where your ejection fraction or your heart function is normal, but you're still having heart failure symptoms those medicines have been really shown to help be helpful with those, which it's the first medicines that's come out that's really shown benefit with that. So we're using them even in our diastolic heart failure patients. Here's just kind of the common names. I wanted to put a plug in here too, because we are, we're finding two of our cardiologists, Dr. Roca and Dr. Benziger are so passionate about these medicines that we're, they're starting kind of, we're in the early stages, but we're starting a cardiometabolic clinic and they're really looking at um, getting these medicines on board, as well as, of course, your statins and, and focusing on, you know, primary prevention before we're needing, you know, for you're having trouble with heart failure, heart disease. The other ones are these GLP-1 receptor antagonists. These are the injectables. I know that a lot of people have been using them for weight loss in addition to blood sugar control. Um, but again, I have not prescribed any of these yet, but this is like part of our cardiometabolic clinic that's kind of up and coming. So I'm just getting familiar with them myself. <clears throat> Things you can do at home, the sodium, that's a huge one. And I know if you ever go out and you look, pull up any nutrition facts, sodium isn't everything. It's even in your, your um, soft water at home. It's in bread. But I tell people, if you can just avoid convenience foods, things that come out of a box or a can, stay to your outside aisles of the grocery store, where your fresh and frozen foods are, but avoiding high sodium intake is huge. <clears throat> With blood pressure control, flu control, um, people who eat high sodium meals at night often have trouble sleeping at night and makes them restless, uh, adds to the swelling of the legs. Um, so if you can cut back on the sodium intake, that really makes a big difference. Fluid restriction. <clears throat> I put 64 ounces. Again, that's for my heart patients. 
Um, I tell them that whole myth of water, 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 you know, I don't want you carrying around a water bottle because you, we don't want you taking in a bunch of water if we got you on a water pill. So you, we want you total fluid intake is less than 64 ounces. I only want them to drink to thirst if you're thirsty drink. But again, we're trying to get rid of all this extra fluid they're carrying. So when your pump isn't working as well, pushing in a bunch of fluids is not what we, what we recommend. So sometimes when we get people who have, you know, kidney issues, which that's very common with our hearts and heart, it's a, it's a fine line or, you know, balance that we try to maintain. Sleep apnea, I know that's been discussed in these um, talks before. I talked a little bit more about it last time. Sleep apnea is highly correlated with heart issues, um, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, high, high blood pressure. And so if, if you have those things, but you can't treat your sleep apnea, we just kind of go in circles trying to uh, control all the AFib or the blood pressure. Um, so I always really encourage people to get that treated uh, if possible exercise, uh, the cardiac rehab after if you have stents um, is very important, but also now Medicare will pay for people who have uh, ejection fractions less than 35% to do cardiac rehab, that same um, one that you could get uh, after a stent, it's phase two cardiac. And I'll tell you what, staying on an activity or exercise regimen makes such a difference for these patients. Avoiding NSAIDs. These are like your ibuprofens, uh, Aleve, uh, Advil. Um, heart failure patients cannot use these because they do increase retention of sodium water. They're also going through the same, you know, through the kidneys where a lot of our heart, heart medications work. And so it does decrease the effectiveness of like the lisinopril or the water pills. So we really uh, try to have people avoid this, which is difficult then in our like you know, our rheumatoid arthritic patient, arthritic patients, or even just, you know, general wear and tear. So we only thing we really recommend is Tylenol, which doesn't always work for people. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of a challenge for some people with avoiding those anti inflammatories. Uh, I, I just like to throw these little tidbits in there, because um, I talk about the, the vascular bed, it can hold up to 10, 10 pounds of fluid before it starts to seep out in tissues. So when I get my patients and they're just full and we're getting those little water blisters on the skin and starting to kind of seep out, I mean, you've got a lot of fluid on board by that time. Two pounds equals like one quart of water extra in the circulation if you gain five pounds. Um, so when we're giving people those parameters, that's equivalent to additional two liters of fluid, which that's a lot of extra on the, on the heart and can definitely contribute to shortness of breath. I encourage people to use their calendars or little weight books um, to track the weights. If your weight goes up, you know, a lot of times they'll say, well, write down, if you, if you go out to eat, ate pizza, weight went up, you know, or you can even write if you got a little symptomatic from that. Um, and so that kind of helps them gauge maybe what they're it's more salt sensitive to. Maybe they can have you know, spaghetti or, or pizza once in a while and doesn't bother them. But if they go out and they have barbecue ribs, it's a little more, they know that that causes them more trouble. So um, the reporting a weight gain of two or three pounds overnight, that is very critical or five pounds in a week just really helps. If you were to ever call into the heart center or even your primary care provider and you got, say you got both coronary disease and heart failure and you're like, I'm more short of breath. The first thing my nurses ask is, well, what's your weight? Because then that helps us kind of gauge if your weight is up, okay, maybe it's more fluid. If your weight's the same or down and you're more short of breath, then maybe it's more coronary or maybe you got pneumonia or something, but it kind of helps us gear which direction um, for us to go. Okay, so I added this then about leg swelling because I was trying to think like, what do I see a lot of and to go over that just because you have leg swelling does not mean you have heart failure. So congestive heart failure I did put is, is can be a cause because that's what we do see a lot of, but also people can just have leg swelling because they're standing on their feet. Age over time, the, the veins in the, in the legs that are bringing the blood back to the heart against gravity all day long, those can get a little bit dilated and those valves don't work as well to push the blood back. So then they, those, those veins get dilated, they lose their ability to push the blood back. And so you can have leg swelling. Generally, if people say, oh, my legs swell and it gets worse as the day goes on, but then I wake up in the morning, it's gone. That's just from 
from having you know poor circulation back to the heart. Again, venous, not arterial. So um, certain medications can cause leg swelling. A big one, of course, is our one of our most common uh, blood pressure medicines is amlodipine. I also see it in like the diltiazem or the verapamils, which those are all um, a certain class of medicines that those do add to swelling. Um, lymphedema, that's something not uh, to do. Like I, is, that's very difficult to treat. We do send some people to physical therapy for that, but that's where it actually gets more swollen along our lymph system. Um, not due to your heart. Thyroid issues, inactivity, and then I added the sleeping in a recliner because I've learned to ask my patients, do you sleep in a bed? Because if they come in and their legs are swollen and I find out they're chronic sleepers and recliner, that's that's, you know, that's kind of a challenge too. We can never really get that fluid back to the heart if they're ne not really laying down in, even with a heart, getting your legs above your heart. So it kind of goes back to the treatment I listed over here to elevate your legs. And um, even just sitting with them on a stool, that's not good enough. You truly need to help go against gravity. I tell people to lay on a sofa or get your legs up on a pillow or in a bed in, or even just laying in a bed or getting them slightly elevated makes a huge difference just to you know kind of get it back, uh, help the blood get back to the heart easier. Compression stockings, I don't know if most people do not like those. Um, they're difficult to get on. But I tell people, some people who have trouble, I said, put them on before you even get out of bed in the morning, you know, have them by your bed, your legs are the skinniest then, because some people, as soon as they put their feet down, they're having swelling. So get the compression stockings on, on in the day, off at night, uh, water pills. Now those will help with the swelling if it's from kind of just retaining fluid overall in your vascular system, not if it's just from having your feet down all day, because the water pills don't just magically reabsorb the fluid from the tissues. It has to be, you know, it has to work. It, the water pills work in the kidneys. So the blood's got to get back to the heart, to the kidneys, and then make urine so you can get rid of it. So I try to um, avoid using a ton of water pills for just people who have what we call venous, venous insufficiency or just difficulty getting the fluid back because we end up drying people out. So we, I really recommend more of the mechanical means, um, you know, compression, elevation, and then if you need to help get a little water pill in there to really um, get more bang for your buck, I guess. Staying active, um, walking, our muscles naturally help squeeze those those vessels to help kind of circulate and bring that blood back up so staying active and walking routinely um, and limit sodium intake medication changes too i did mention um again that kind of goes back to like typically like i said with my heart patients if i see that they're on amlodipine i will try to either decrease the dose or change that up a little bit um I added these things on the end. I've talked about them in the past because with heart failure, it can be progressive, um, obviously. And so once you start getting to where, okay, the medications aren't working anymore, um, or you know, your, your heart function is less than 35% and you're starting to get symptomatic, or even if it's just at this point, it's just your heart functions at less than 35%, we can't get it up higher. We do recommend device therapy, such as implantable cardiac defibrillator. That's roughly the size of like a deck of cards. Uh, it's a little smaller and that's inserted in a pocket in your chest, like a pacemaker. Um, and that uh, implantable defibrillator, that does not provide any kind of pacing in general, it does have a lower limit set at, at 40. So if by chance your heart, something goes on your heart function or your, excuse me, your heart rate drops below 40, it'll just kind of, you know, pace you. But typically that is just to watch your rhythm because anytime your heart function is less than 35%, that ventricle is weak and it puts you at an increased risk for a cardiac arrest. So a cardiac arrest is when your heart goes into a uh, kind of chaotic rhythm, like a ventricular tachycardia or uh, a ventricular fibrillation. And so these devices are life-saving. Um, they, they, like if you've seen where they put the paddles on people, this is internal. So this is, it'll recognize it and the device will try to capture the, the rhythm and pace it out on its own. Um, we call that anti-tachycardic pacing. So it'll try to pace the rhythm out on its own. And if that don't work, then it delivers a, a shock and people feel it. And, and but it, like I said, it's, it is life-saving. Um, if they have a low heart 
function of less than 35% and a rhythm abnormality called a left bundle branch block. Uh, now that is where um, kind of in a normal conduction, you've got your own pacemaker, which I call a pa this, uh, my own pacemaker, like a sinus node that goes down from the top of your heart to the middle of the heart to something called an AV node that talks to your bottom chambers. Then it branches off into a left and right side going down your left ventricle, your right ventricle. It stops kind of talking to that left side. So then what can happen is you can get like this swaying motion. So the right ventricle beat and the left will just kind of follow and your heart can get this swaying motion, which eventually contributes to um, weakening of that muscle. And then you don't, uh, you're not getting uh, synchronous beats of your right and left ventricle like you should to get um, optimal, you know, optimal cardiac output. So there is a, what I call like the Cadillac device called the um, CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy. And that can be in combination with the defibrillator, but this one is actually where you get three leads in versus just one. And this, the, the one lead goes into what we call the coronary sinus, and then um, also into the right ventricle. And so then those, those are, that's what this device is where we want it to work 100% of the time, I want it to pace you. That's our goal, because when it's pacing, then it's getting both your chambers to beat together. So people feel better. This one is, is this one will make you feel better. It's pacing all the time and it'll make you feel better because it's getting both your ventricles to be together. So that's, that's again, like one of the th things, if I can't um, with uh, medications, get your heart function up above 35% after a good three to six months of, of medical therapy, then we usually go to device therapy in addition. So this is something like for end stage um, called mechanical circulatory support. So our left ventricular assist device. And this is when somebody, you know, okay, the medical, the medicines aren't working. You know, they got the CRT in and um, frequent hospitalizations. And um, so this is where you actually need assistance of that ventricle uh, to, to pump the blood. And it's a drive line uh, that this is inside your stomach. This comes out attached to a control, or we call this a controller. These are batteries here on the side. Your heart is fully dependent on outside um, electrical sources now because it does, the bottom of it comes into this bottom of this left ventricle and then goes up here right above the aortic valve. There's a little propeller in here and that circulates, it's continuous circulation. So people who have these LVADs won't have a regular pulse because this is just, it's not like you got this lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, but you got this, it's continuous. And a lot of times when this goes back up here, this aortic valve then will fuse because it's, you really don't have anything going out of that now, out of the aortic valve, It's this is all emptying up above it. So these can be, put in for um, what we call either destination therapy. Uh, so that's like if someone, you're not a transplant candidate, they can put in and that this is what you live on. You plug into a, uh, elect, you know, your home electrical source at night, um, but you're constantly, you know, dependent on these batteries. And, or some people we call bridge to therapy where you need this until you can get a heart transplant. So I, I used to have a few patients with this. Um, the longest one I had live with one was for six years. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's kind of end stage therapy. This, this was an old slide I had as for HeartMate 2. There now is a HeartMate 3. I think there's even a newer one out there. I don't currently have any patients with those. But um, the, I guess one of the most important take home thing messages that I, I try to tell my patients all the time is please contact me while you're, you know, if you start having any symptoms, don't wait until it's emergency or, or you're already decompensated. If I personally, I see what adds to um, the prognosis or what adds to, you know, when you have heart failure is if you're constantly getting overloaded. So you wait and wait, wait, no, I'm overloaded. And then you take water pills and try to treat it. That recurrent swelling on that heart, stretching that muscle really wears it out. So I prefer, you know, we, I, with our heart, I do a heart failure program here and 
they're always in contact with my nurses if they have symptoms. Again, um, so I'd rather have you call me sooner than later. So that's about all I got. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jen. That was some good stuff as usual. So we did have a question in the chat box. It says, does sounding help, does taking saunas help contribute to heart health? If so, what is your recommendation for how many you should take? <laughs> um, saunas, I, I don't really know how it contributes to her heart health, but it, you know, we just personally we caution with the use of saunas in like hot tubbing, just because you get that, you know, rapid dilatation or dilating of your vessels. And so I do find that that puts them in, in and they're taking heart meds that are already dilating their vessels. Um, so I think I just caution that it doesn't dehydrate you or drop your blood pressure. So you're not passing out in there. Um, so I, what I tell my patients who love to sauna is just be aware, you know, how long you're in there make sure you're staying hydrated. If you're getting lightheaded or dizzy, you know, of course get out. So, cause some, some of my, you know, Finlanders, they just love those uh, saunas. And so I can't tell them no, but I just tell them to be cautious, make sure that they're not getting too, too dry in there when they're taking heart medicines. Right. And don't forget to tell them don't pee on the rocks too. Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> There's another question that says, is there anything younger people should do for checkups if their family has high percentage of heart issues, fatalities? Yes. I think if you have a um, and we see some people, you know, where they come in, in, you know, like they've had fa early family member deaths or stenting or bypassing. And so we usually, I like to get a baseline EKG, um, the lipid panel, make sure the blood pressure is controlled. And we do know that if there is a high family risk of, and if your cholesterol, if the cholesterol looks great, you know, then we just encourage, of course, good dieting, exercising. Um, but we do use uh, preventative statin therapy, like with a, a 10 milligrams of Crestor or Rosuvastatin to help, you know, just keep the vascular bed nice and stable and keep inflammation down and placking from developing. So yeah, I think just like a routine physical and getting all that done and kind of see where you're at and go from there. So I know you did answer the question. I had a question about the aspirin that it, that it is beneficial because I did see mm -hmm. that they were saying that to, to stop taking it. Mm -hmm. But also the meds that you were talking about, I know some of them have side effects. Mm -hmm. um, like the Inzestro, you know, it says they say don't take it if you have uh, liver disease or diabetes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that some of the side effects that it has is lightheaded or uh, tiredness and kidney problems mm -hmm. i was also thinking about like the ib the ibuprofen like the motrin mm -hmm. you know, the older players you know back in like your dad's age my dad's age and even me you know back back with you if you kind of got hurt or whatever you used ib just for uh to help with pain or whatever. I was just wondering if that might have contributed to some of my health issues that I have. Well, I know it adds to um, like acute, you know, kidney injury, it, you know, I, so I don't know long-term use. It's more focused on the um, kidneys with those anti-inflammatories more so than heart. But if the kidneys start giving you trouble, then of course, and that can eventually cause you trouble with uh, fluid retention and, you know, general inflammation too. So there's another question that says, is CFH hereditary? Um, some of it, some, some forms of it. Yes. There is this one we call hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's kind of very, specialized heart failure that is highly um, hereditary. And we do recommend uh, echo screenings for family members in that. Yes. So that kind is, otherwise, if it's linked to where like it's coronary, coronary disease or heart disease is the most common cause of heart failure. So it depends on what, you know, kind of what the cause is. So if you can narrow it down to that, then, then yeah, then that's how we treat it yeah i think i'm starting to hear, hear more a couple of people to uh, address the issue that they are starting to have like some heart issues with uh after having covid mm -hmm. yep we are 
we've seen we've seen quite a few of those people just worried you know and so we will do like if I have some heart failure patients and they had a long hospitalization or they're really struggling because it's hard for them to tell is it my heart or it, is it still COVID because the symptoms you know you're short of breath you're fatigued um, and so we are you know we are keeping an eye and working up people uh, repeating echoes or giving it a little time you know after their infection to see, you know, if the, how, you know, which, if it's the heart or COVID. All right. So anyone else have any more questions for Jen? I said, you know, I know both her and Dr. Dury presentations were very detailed and there was a lot of great information on there. And, you know, it, it is hard for people being in person in Zoom, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. for people to ask questions. So anyone else have any more questions? We do. Uh, can DM, DM cause CHF? I, I, yeah, I mean, again, you know, primarily I link it to the diabetes contributing to the coronary disease that causes the heart failure, but just having diabetes and not coronary disease, not so much. I mean, it's just that it's kind of that cause and effect going down the line with the coronary disease is typically where I see those overlap. So what about like, um, I know we have people that are, have knowledge about using a, like a herbal medicines or traditional medicines for, uh, for heart issues, but I was wondering, is there, do you know of any, any other traditional medicines or remedies that, that might be beneficial? I do not. Um, I, I get a lot of questions about that. And I often, I, we have a cardiac pharmacist that I bounce a lot of that off of because I'm not up to date on other, you know, other things that are in right. some of these um, alternative therapies. So I'm, I don't wish I did wish I knew so of a, what about a good you? one. So what if there is a person that does, uh, they're able to get like um, traditional medicines? Uh, if they came and seen you, and would you recommend them to keep keep taking them? Or would you maybe, maybe try to tell them to wean off or it depends on how they were doing with it. You know, I, I, per, you know, of course, you know, with, with where I'm coming from with the treatment of heart failure and the medications, I, I'm okay with, depending on what it is, okay with you using it, but I, I don't, I don't, per, you know, I don't want you to use that and then stop all your heart meds, which we know work, right. you know what I'm saying? But if you're using both and you're feeling well, then I'm okay with that. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So no, there's also a comment that says you can also look at WebMD for drug interaction with traditional medicines. Okay. So that's from our that's a good site, uh, natural mm -hmm. herbs, which is a place I, I look at a lot for a lot of herbal medications. Um, and it tells you if there have been studies on it, what, what the indications have been, you know, if there's side effects that are known um, and so forth. So I find that to be a pretty helpful website too. Well, good that you said the natural one, the natural That's remedies. Called natural medicines. Used to be natural medicine. remedies. Okay. Anyone else out there that has any questions for any of the panelists? The panelists are still on, I believe. I know Dr. Dury is on. I know Peyton's on. Jen is on, and I know we forgot to ask people any questions for us. So we'll just wait a couple, couple more seconds here, see if anyone else has any questions that they want to type up on the chat. So I know it was uh, time went by quick, and I really wish we did have more time because there was a lot of good stuff on here. And uh, Dr. Dury, for the ones that still want to stay on, I think we still have have probably about a half hour left if you wanted to show your video so i'll see here anyone else have any more questions or comments for jennifer or any of the panelists okay here's one that says is partial is partial blockage to the artery 
ever referred to as sick flow? <laughs> um, I haven't heard of it, but maybe. I don't know if you know of that, Dr. Dury, but I haven't. I've never heard the term, but yeah. it refers to that way. I don't know. Yeah. I, so, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I know there is, um, you know, with the partial blockage, we will monitor it. Like, we don't treat it unless it is um, greater than 70 or 80 percent or depending what vessel it is. Um, that's just one thing I wanted to add uh, regarding um, <clears throat> partial blockage. All right, any more questions? I said now is the time to ask. Like I said, you know, I know uh, people get referred to Jen and she is very good and very knowledgeable resource to utilize and to go see her. So if you're able to go see her, go see her. Uh, she will do her best <laughs> as always to get you back up and running. Um, any more questions? And um, nothing's really popping up here. So I guess with that, I'd like to say thank you, Jen, for thank you. providing your resource and your knowledge. It's always great to have you because you always uh, offer so much knowledge that people could take in and whatnot. Yeah, I, so and I encourage anyone to call um you know, our office, if you have questions that uh, are want to be seen for our, you know, we, like I said, we're starting that cardiometabolic clinic. So I'm anxious to see what, what goes on there. But um, like I said, that's in the initial stages, but always give a call if you have questions or, um, or, or you know, need, want to be seen or if you have palpitations, we do, you don't need necessarily referral, but um, that is helpful. <laughs> Right. That's, oh. what, that's what my question was going to be. Yeah. Like somebody from our community, would they have to get a referral? Mm -mm. No. No. Okay. No. So, I, yeah, I, one time I saw someone, he, it said in the reason for visit was referred by neighbor. So I saw his neighbor and <laughs> he, his neighbors would go see Jen. So, I, yeah. So, yeah, I know you can just, you can just call our office here. So, but I appreciate uh, having me again, Squidge. I always enjoy it. Thank you. I appreciate you as usual. Okay. Okay. All right. Take care. All right, yep. We'll see ya. Okay. Bye -bye. And if there's anyone that wants to stick around to watch Dr. Dury's. You're muted. Switch. Okay. There we go. So we will be uh, sending out an email for who all won the prizes. I know people are probably anxious to hear about that and who won. But uh, whenever you're ready, Dr. Dury, you could start your video. All right. Why is it? Let's see. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> well, it'll take a little longer if this happens. Let's see here. Let's get rid of that. Okay, let's do this. Oh, it's okay. Sorry, I, I had it going before and now we're struggling, but I think I'm good. There we go. And okay, you got that? Yeah, we're good to go. All right, there we go. It's 16 minutes. There's some parts where you're just kind of sitting there watching them fuss around a little bit, but it's only 16 minutes long. Okay.
She'd been having some symptoms of shortness of breath and some chest pain. And her primary care physician had gotten a stress test, which was mildly abnormal. And so we decided that, that this would be the next best thing to try to figure out if these symptoms, which were not necessarily related to heart disease, but could have been, you know, whether there were serious blockages that need to be fixed or not. Okay, now we're going to put our small sheath in place. That's how we do it the procedure. It's like a small straw. You might feel a little bit of pressure in your wrist. So this is called a coronary angiography, which means, you know, basically injecting dye into the heart arteries and looking for blockages. Next, I'm going to inject a little bit of medication. That's to keep the artery from clamping down. This may burn a little bit, okay? That's normal. So this is the, the catheter that we'll use to inject uh, contrast into the, into the arteries and look for blockages. We're using a, a small wire to get that up and up to the heart. Okay. Go ahead and give that. That wire is just on the outside. You know, everything we do though. carries some slight risk, but bad things are very uncommon in this procedure. You know, we do a lot of them and, and take care of people and make them feel a lot better through this. And so, you know, it's always one of those things where we're weighing the risk and benefit. And if we've decided to do it, we think the benefit outweighs the risk and, and we're really trying to help, help you. So they've threaded the wire just to the outside of the aortic valve which is where those little openings to feed the coronary arteries are. So the aortic valve is right about here. Okay. 
And now they've shredded it into the right coronary artery. So right now we're just uh, we're taking pictures to look at the heart arteries. Um, we're gonna give a little bit of medication just to make sure that the sometimes the artery can spasm when we put our catheters in. So we want to make sure that that's okay. We just take pictures at different angles to get different views of the arteries. Almost the artery to the right side of the heart. We're gonna, we're gonna go left. Listen, can you take another big breath in for me? Hold it. Breathe when you need to. Okay. Can I get a uh, JL 2.5 catheter? So sometimes the catheter shapes, some work better than others. And so we're going to try a slightly different one, see if it's sort of easier. JL 3.5? Yes, please. Thank you. Who's a relatively healthy person who, you know, was an outpatient. I thought that, you know, it was likely that we'd be successful at being able to accomplish the procedure through the through the arm. And, you know, the benefit really is that for one, the biggest benefit is that it's a lower bleeding risk than going through the leg. So, you know, obviously we, we want to try to prevent any complications of the procedure. So that's number one. Sometimes people feel like it's a little slightly more comfortable because they don't have to lay flat for several hours after the procedure. Um, whereas if we go through the leg, they have to. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a slight chance that we're unable to complete the procedure through the arm, either because the arteries are very curvy up in the chest or, or because of the way the heart sits. Uh, in the chest, you know, or if, if they're very complicated blockages that we need to fix and use very uh, larger catheters, those, those tubes that we use uh, to do our procedure. You can take a big breath in for me. Breathe normally.
on our side just a little bit. We take pictures at multiple angles to make sure that sometimes blockages can be somewhat eccentric or meaning like on one side of a vessel and we see them better in certain views than others. So, so we just kind of move our x-ray machine around and take, uh, take pictures at different angles and look for blockages. Who's in? Yeah, we have good news for you. We're all done. Okay, I'll show you the pictures in just a second. You have some some minor blockages, but nothing that we need to put balloons and stents in. So these are things we'll treat with medications and get you feeling better. Okay. All right. Any questions I can answer for you right now? Okay, we're gonna get this small tube out of your wrist, a little bit of bracelet, a bracelet that holds pressure on it, and then we'll get you home, you know, midday. Okay, sound good? Yeah, that would be fine. As long as you're not doing heavy lifting with that arm, that'll be fine. So if you wanna look this way, I'll show you the picture. So this is the artery to the right of the heart. Our catheter is kind of in there, and it's at a little blockage, and so I gave some medication and it's it's kind of a mild to moderate blockage there. That's not something that we really need to fix right now, okay? We're gonna treat you with good medicines for the heart and keep that from getting worse, okay? This is a little bit different view, but the same, the same artery, okay? Well, that, that's our goal with the medications like for cholesterol and things like that. Our goal is to try to prevent the blockages from getting worse, okay? So this is the artery to the left, kind of the front and the side of the heart. And, and again, there's some, some kind of minor irregularities there. Um, maybe like way down the vessel, there's a little bit of a blockage there. But these are, these are things that we treat with medication. These are not things we treat. Um, with balloons and scents, so that's good news. Yeah. It's a little bit different. Okay. Any questions for me? Okay. Obviously, you know, if things change, we're happy to bring you back, but there's nothing that we need to do right now, okay? This is good news. So we're going to get this tube out, and then we'll be all done. Get you off this hard drive, okay? All right, you're welcome. That's pretty much it. So I thought that was an interesting uh, 16 minutes, kind of a behind the curtain thing of what uh, goes on. Yeah, it was. So what is the, um, I know you probably don't do those, but is there, I know there's always that chance of not going through a procedure like that, pulling through a procedure like that, or the odds probably pretty low, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I mean, that they do so many of these and you rarely, uh, have complications from them. I can't speak to specific numbers, right? But um, yeah, and you've got the cardiologist right there, so they can respond right away if there's issues. But yeah, it's very low risk nowadays. They're doing these all the time. So uh, that lady was she awake for that procedure? Yep, she was awake the whole time. Um, she could doze off, but I, it didn't sound like they had to wake her up to talk to her. So she was probably just watching so where is the probably the closest place where they do a procedure like that Duluth Duluth huh? okay yep yeah. and it's pretty routine now yeah yeah I know uh even like 
I think for like knee surgeries and hip replacements. Um, oh, geez. Oh, sorry, I got kicked out for a quick second. But yeah, I mean, even like a the hip surgery I did, you know, I was uh, in and out uh, released the next day. And I think when knee knee surgeries, they're sending people home the same day. So it's mm -hmm. pretty crazy how far along they've come nowadays. Mm -hmm. All right, is there any other people on that are on that have any questions or any final thoughts or anything that they'd like to see or share? Okay, if not, I'll just thank everybody for showing up. Hopefully, I know you guys got some good information. We will be sending out our email who all won prizes. And I thank you again, Dr. Dury, for your for your knowledge and everything that you shared. And it's good to see you. And uh, like I said, I know I look forward to doing some more with these with you and some collaboration work down the road. So thank you again, Dr. Dury. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, everybody's saying thanks. Great conference. Thank you. Good conference. Good job. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yep.